Really? <coughs> One minute? No, we're on, well, we're on the air. So. Okay, oh, yeah. go down. You should, you should see. <laughs> uh, good evening. Uh, welcome to uh, the Zoning Board of Appeals meeting of Tuesday, September 24th, 2013. Um, I will call the meeting to order. The uh, first order of business is to uh, approve the minutes of August 27th. I move we approve the minutes of August 27th. Second that. Okay. Any discussion, comments? Okay. Uh, all in favor? Any opposed? Okay. Four, five, five zero with. Give me a second. We'll uh, we have a motion to approve the August 27th minutes. Uh, uh, that's been seconded. Uh, First one. Four against. All four. All four. All right. So that's six zero approval for the minutes. I think we have both some old business and obviously some new business. Um, uh, we have, uh, I think, what amounts to two uh, administrative appeals that are looking to be heard uh, this evening. Um, the, uh, the old one would be uh, essentially the, the remand of Maynard and Deborah Murphy that came back from uh, the court. We also have an uh, administrative appeal um, dated June 3rd, uh, uh, I'm sorry, no, June 3rd, June 3rd, um, concerning, uh, the, uh, uh, the issuance by the, uh, CEO of a determination of the Shoreland Performance Overlay District. Um, so, uh, I've seen, at least in the papers, that um, the Murphys would like to have the administrative appeal heard this evening, and I don't believe the uh, Goldmans object to that either, but I may be getting ahead of myself. Um, Are you referring to the appeal of the letter? Yes. The, yes. Right. Okay. And, and Chair, I don't uh, know, perhaps the CEO would know. Um, are we allowed to hear something where there hasn't been a public notice that it's going to be on the calendar for the evening? Uh, it's, it's substantively part of the remand. And as the, the Murphy's attorney pointed out in the letter, uh, he, he simply submitted the appeal to protect themselves, but it, it's something that would have been heard along with the remand either way. Got it. Okay. And, and they requested that it be combined, and I, I don't think we have opposition to it. Got it. Okay. So uh, I, I guess a question for um, this board is uh, whether we want to take up both, um, again, the remand as well as the, um, the administrative appeal of, of June 3rd. I mean, they're obviously linked so I don't have a problem with it okay. it's my yeah. I, I, I mean I don't I don't either um, I guess unless anyone has an objection we'll 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 listen to both appeals this evening you know as part of this part of this this meeting okay okay um, so I, I guess uh, with, with that said, uh, maybe we should turn to the, um, 
to, to the, I guess, the application that we have this evening, which is the, the, the June 3rd administrative appeal um, and the CEO's determination of the Shoreland Performance Overlay District boundary. Um, I, I think that there's, it seems to me that we're kind of, in, in reading through the material, I see uh, three issues that have kind of evolved here. Uh, w one is generally um, whether the Murphys have standing in which to bring the appeal in the first place. Um, secondly, we have a question around what is the location of the uh, natural high water mark um, for purposes of defining um, the Shoreland Overlay District. And I think thirdly, um, in defining the Shoreland Overlay District, are we using the high water mark um, as your starting point, or does the zoning map come into play? Um, so I, I think uh, I'd like to suggest that we perhaps um, listen for, to um, uh, the Murphys as to um, the standing issue um, um, and then give uh, the Goldmans an opportunity to respond. And I think then we should take up the standing issue up front because if they have standing, great. We can go into the other issues. If they don't have standing, you know, we move on. And to be clear, this is the underlying standing issue, not the standing issue with respect to the CEO's determination of yes, the challenge. Yes, it's the underlying standing issue. So with that, um, Mr. and Mrs. Murphy or counsel, would you like to come up and? I just called my counsel when he said he was three minutes away. So okay. I'd like to ask permission to wait for him. Okay. Please. Um, while we're waiting, would you like to, would the Goldmans like to address standing or would you like to wait until you've heard from the? Sorry? Great, so I have to, we have to do what, a little song and dance routine here for well, three or four minutes. We decided before 4-3 that there was standing. I don't think anything in the Superior Court's decision in any way affected that analysis, from my perspective, but at the same time I was in the four as opposed to the three. Uh, we, we, the, what was lacking was a more detailed uh, um, laid out factual finding as to why there was standing, but otherwise we made the determination previously that there was standing. Right, and so with the remand, we simply have an opportunity to revisit that um, one way or the other. Um, uh, you know, I, I, again, we've got, we had, we determined, we determined last month, but if we're essentially going through the process again, um, you know, there's been obviously, subse you know, subsequent materials that have been presented to the you know, before the board now that, um, you know. Which, which I think was a quirk of, in it sounds like uh, the gold bins will um, Obviously, based on the filings, they're going to dispute whether there's standing, but I think it was a quirk of the fact that we had uh, issue after issue after issue, and we viewed it as a... <laughs> exactly. uh, I wonder if... Um, let me throw out the... Uh, while we're waiting, and perhaps it's three minutes, perhaps not, um, whether... Um, we should hear the um, the request of the Hickox I think we while we're. I think we should. I think okay. we should move along. Um, so we're going to do that in the interest of keeping the ball rolling. Um, uh, are the uh, is is Miss Hickox here? Okay, here, good. Um, so uh, are you? Would you be all set to? Okay, good. So why don't we? move just to the second agenda item, which is to hear the request of Gail M. Hickok 
of 181 Fowler Road, Map U44, Lot 32, for a home business conditional use permit to operate a canine, canine rehabilitation business. Um, Ms. Hickok, would you like to, yes, come on up and So I, I don't really know how to proceed here. Do you, um, I know that you've all gotten um, packets of the information um, in advance. And okay. um, I think in the paragraph that I sent to you um, along with the application, I tried to make um, a distinction between what is the normal traffic of that particular business. We actually opened the pool not having any idea what we were doing last year. And so um, I had no idea there were sort of tiers to the in-home occupation process. But Ben has cleared that up for me. And he has, he has said the definition is that if you are seeing any clients, then you have to have a permit. So I apologize for that ignorance on, on our part. Um, so at any rate, um, we, we started seeing a few um, animals there last year. And again, no real idea what might happen, because it was we didn't open until midsummer. But this year, we opened um, around the 1st of May. And so the traffic, typically, for a business day is that one animal at a time comes, um, generally no more than four to six clients a day. Um, I think you've seen in your packet, packet that I put pictures in there showing that we do indeed have a turnaround so that people can turn their cars around and drive facing out. Um, so I, I think um, th there was an issue that came up and the reason the issue came up um, this past August is that there was a rather famous photographer who um, wanted to come and shoot for his next book in that pool. Not, this was not part of my business. This was a, an event, completely separate. And so we agreed to have him do that. Um, we scheduled all attendees. Um, we had parking attendants. All parking was done in our driveway. Um, and I believe then, at that point, uh, a complaint went into the um, police station because the first time frame was on a Sunday from two hours, from 9 to 11, when we had puppy practice for the shoot. <laughs> and uh, so, but, but everybody was, um, I think, acting accordingly, very safe. I didn't see anything hazardous. And in fact, just to make sure, I did have a conversation with dispatch at the Cape Police Department um, early September. Um, I really wanted to, to get a copy of any kind of complaint of the record, the dispatch record, to see what had happened, resultants of the complaint. And according to the dispatch, he could not give me a copy because there was no report. And I said, what does that mean? And he said, that means that we didn't have to do anything, that there was no danger, we didn't have to stop you, we didn't have to call you or anything. So in terms of the event, um, I, I think that the complaint was directed to the event, I'm not sure, um, that uh, the Cape Elizabeth Police Department found it not to be anything hazardous or dangerous or anything of that nature. Um, and in terms of my regular business and how that runs, um, it, it technically has been in existence for 13 months, and I don't believe there's been a single complaint ever um, about noise, about traffic hazards, about possible pollutants, um, not to my knowledge. And I also think that my direct abutters on either side of me at 179 and 183 um, have actually sent letters of support for the permit.
Chair, if, uh, if I may. Yes. Uh, I'd recommend that we start by going through the criteria for uh, home business uh, in the definitions on page nine. Just step through. On page? Page nine, at the very beginning of the ordinance, where it defines uh, to qualify for home business, all of the following criteria need to be met. It's under the heading home business. Perhaps we should also then clarify whether this is intended to be a conditional use or home business, which uh, category it's intended to fall under. Well, the application doesn't really say, does it? <laughs> the letter to the, the letter three pages in says home business. That's why. I think it's both. Both. Okay. Yes, uh, for the applicant, uh, if I may. Um, is anyone employed besides yourself? No. Okay. Did you obtain an estimate as to the overall amount of vehicle traffic on the street uh, that the building is on? I'm going to guess the answer is no, but. The answer is no. But uh, the average daily traffic is um, over 10 trips a day? To, uh, to me? There and back uh, uh, for business traffic. So I, in order to qualify for a home business, and we're, it's up for discussion whether there's a home business or conditional use, okay. uh, in order, there's seven criteria to be met for a home business, one of which mm -hmm. is the uh, the nature of the business or professional use shall not increase vehicular traffic on the street by more than 2% of the current average annual daily traffic or 10 trips a day, which is ever, whichever is larger. So uh, some applicants rely on just the 10 trips a day so they don't have to figure out what the average yearly traffic is on the road because that can be a hassle. Right. So the easier is simply to say whether you meet the, there will be less than 10 trips a day. And a trip is going in is one trip, going out <coughs> is a second trip is my understanding. Okay. So. Okay. I believe that's correct. So if you have five customers or less mm -hmm. um, a day, then you would meet that criteria. So I guess the question is, your average amount of uh, business coming in and out, is it less than five customers a day? Um, average is probably five or less. Four, four, to, you know, four to six occurrences, five days a week. So it's under the 10. Although the six then goes to 12, so. Each occurrence is a visitor. Oh, well, I thought you were asking for the average. Is your four to six per, per trip or per occurrence? This is four to six clients are typically scheduled, so. So it's eight to yeah. 12. Eight to 12. And your visitors, do they park while they're there with their animals? Yes, that's what the turnaround is for. It, so they park on the street or? No. They park on your property. No, I, I think there are pictures, actually, of the turnaround in your packet. Uh, um, I'm, I'm just trying to step. I, I, I apologize if some of my questions seem redundant of what's in the package, but I'm just trying to step through the criteria so we can just check. Okay, sure. So, but there is parking provided for visitors, and it's off street. It's on your lot. Yes, that is correct. And do you have any sign? No. Is there any outdoor storage of equipment or material? Uh, I mean, there's the pool itself. Be beyond the pool itself. But that's it. Do you use the pool for purposes other than the rehabilitation of the animals? Um, it's, a, it's a family 
pool as well, recreational family pool. How many dogs do you have there at any given time? One. Just one? Yes. Do you have any pets yourself? Yes, I have three dogs. Have you made any, any outside of the just the pool, the pool itself, have you made any external alterations of the building or the site um, specifically for this business? No. So uh, for the pool, for the, the animals themselves, is there specialized equipment that's used with the animals that's stored outside? Um, nothing other than life jackets. So I guess I would say all the criteria except pot potentially number two are met. The, into the extent that a limitation is placed of no more than five clients. A day, that What's uh, criteria would be met? Do we know the total square footage ah, of point. the of your residence set somewhere around here, or really of your lot more than your residence? Because um, one of the criteria here is again that you, it, it can't ex the business professional use shall occupy an area no greater than twenty percent of the floor area of the structure. So does does that include the pool being outside of the home? Question. <laughs> How is structured? I don't. Probably outside of the structure. And then you, but you do use the uh, you're using the yeah the, the garage space half of the garage space is 266 square feet. And what's the you know approximately the total square footage of your house? Is that an, is it an attached garage? Yes. According to your oh, it should be right here on the. Uh, so it was 45 by 24, approximately, for the dimensions of the house? That's what I'm, yes, that's what I'm seeing here. That's 900, a little over 1,000 feet, so actually that's, that's close. And there's the and it's a floor, floor area of structure is defined. It's, just, it's, it's, it's defined in there. So I'm sorry, it wasn't, it was, it is under 20 percent? The other point I just want to make is this is a seasonal business. I don't know if that matters or not or factors in at all. I did my math right, it looks like it's a little over 1,600 total square feet for between the house and the garage. Times 0.2 is 320 feet and the used area is 266. So it's below the 20%, assuming that garage is included in calculating. Yes. With the additional wrinkle of what's the effect of the pool. The pool doesn't fit oh, into that. The pool doesn't fit in at all. Yeah. I believe the garage does, though. So right. Yep. It's yep. Addition, but not yeah. the. I mean, I'm, with, with that, I mean, I'm willing to say that it complies with, with seven. I'm sorry, not seven. Uh, five. Square footage is less than 20% of the overall structure. So, so long as the number of clients per day trips in is uh, less than five, you would, I guess we'd have to take a vote to make sure that we all agree on this, but you would qualify as a home business, it sounds like, is where we're, we're heading towards. And, and just to be clear, it is a you are reviewing it as a conditional use as well. If she wanted to go above the five, or if she, as the, that, that's the, the interesting wrinkle of if she falls under home business, 
do we even need to reach the conditional use application? Yeah, the, the home business is a conditional use yeah, application. In, in her zone. John, can I ask a question? If you look under yes, for reads and accessory use. I see a lot of backing from the dogs. The dogs that I see are very old. Most of them are, can barely walk. They're all under control. They all come leashed and they move immediately into the garage and there is no, in fact, I'm going to be honest, the poodles across the street bark way more than any of my dogs do. Okay, thank you. Yeah. And, and when the um, dogs visit for the therapy session, do they interact with your dogs, which could no, cause barking? No, not at all. No. I suppose if there's any problem, the neighbors will come and say so. And uh, pr presumably you have uh, some system in place to clean up of any uh, dog waste. Yes, we're, we're, very, we're very good at that. We're very efficient. Mm -hmm. uh, did you see, uh, there were a couple of um, letters that were attached to the package from a couple of neighbors. Um, uh, one was in support, one uh, of, the, of the business, and uh, one uh, speaks to um, uh, cars are parking on the side of Fowler Road, five cars at a time with dog ramps. Um, I, I, it sounds as though that there's been times when there's that, been... If that happened at all, it happened during the event. The photo shoot. The, during the photo shoot. The photo, photo shoot. shoot, yes. Yes, and we'll, that will never happen again. Dogs being dogs, um, the cleanup of the, of the, the dog's waste, is that mm -hmm. all kept? They, they don't roam off your property at all? Absolutely not. They're always leashed, you know, and, and I'm always out there to direct the people to come right into the garage space. And, of course, we always pick up. Are there any other uh, home businesses that, that you're aware of in, in your neighborhood on Fowler? Well, there's the little farm stand that's at the end of Fowler, the little organic farm stand. Okay. John, another question? Is Diane Joyce here? Diane Joyce wrote quite a letter. Yeah, I, I, I mentioned the letter. I asked a few questions. Right, but she has a lot of points in here. That, uh, seven days a week, uh, 20 cars a day. Well, I guess she didn't show up, so. Okay, thanks, John. Anyone else have any questions for the applicant? I had one question. Yeah. Under the um, conditional use uh, section, there's a, uh, I guess a performance guarantee. I'm not sure what that would come under. Other than, would your business be insured, or does it have uh, other than the homeowner insurance? Would it be independent? I have professional liability insurance to a million dollars. I, uh, so you list the typical office hours as uh, 10 to 5 on Saturday, Sunday, Tuesday, and then uh, Tuesday, Wednesday, and then Thursday. Mm -hmm. so, so just Monday and Friday are the two days that you don't, that, that you have off in effect? Right, when, when the pool is open. So if we placed a restriction on, um, in granting the conditional use on um, being open on either Saturday or Sunday, 
would you be amenable to that restriction? Um, I, if it's going to be one day, I would prefer it would be Sunday if I can ask that, but yes. Sorry, uh, Chair, I have a question across the uh, board. Is the idea is to limit the time that the business is going to be open to five days, or is it a potential up to six days? It's, uh, I guess my thought is that if it's a home business, normally when I think businesses, I think Monday to Friday, and then people are home, and if people, for people that are working, if an activity is occurring during the work day, it's not going to impact them as much as if it's occurring on the weekend. So obviously not everyone is working uh, nine to five jobs. Um, either way though, if we're, if we're allowing a home business in and there's concerns as to the traffic and quiet enjoyment of the neighbors, it seems like if one weekend day was set aside that the business is op not operating, it would has, have less of an impact on the neighbors. And so that under that discussion, Sunday would be perhaps the day that there would not be a business, but the applicant would request that that Sunday be included as part of her days of operation. Is oh, I, I might have misunderstood. I thought the applicant said Sunday's the day she would, if she had to choose between the two, she'd rather be you, open on Saturday. You are Sunday. correct. Thank you. And, uh, if, uh, if we put in there a condition where the, the, the number of um, uh, daily traffic occurrences weren't more than, uh, were, were not to exceed 10, mm -hmm. which is code anyway. But so five clients a day, no more. That's correct. I guess the, I guess I would, uh, like to hear what you, your thoughts on whether having this uh, this home business has any impact on the property values of your abutting neighbors or just your neighbors generally. Um, well, you have a letter from one of my abutting neighbors, and I I thought you were going to have a letter from the other abutting neighbor, but I guess that didn't happen. But there we've never. I mean, we've been there 13 months, and we've never had anything but pleasant conversations with them. Never, they've never had a problem with us. Um, and as far as the aesthetics or the land value, I think that pool and the landscaping has only added to to that location. Uh, you've lived there thir 13 months. No, no, no. The the pool has been open there yeah, for okay. 13 months. How long, have you, how long have you lived there? Since 1995. So the dogs are either in the garage or they're in the pool or the surrounding area. Mm -hmm. That's it. That's it. Do you know how many uh, of your neighbors have in-ground pools? Well, 179 does. I think 185 does. And there's at least, there's one, a house for sale down further on Fowler Road has an in-ground. I think there's one more besides that, that I know of. So there's four or five? Mm -hmm. you can Okay, in the area, yep. on, in, on Fowler Road. Yep. I'm just kind of going through the standards of the conditional use and just getting comfortable with the, uh, the home business and its Any other questions for the applicant? Uh, 
the last, just last question for me. Um, how long have you had the dogs, the three dogs that you have now? Oh, our dogs? Yes. The More than five years. Oh, yeah, eight years. And so what we're talking about is adding a fourth dog, possibly a fifth dog, when there's a changeover. And that's the maximum number of dogs on your property. Right. Right. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, any uh, uh, comments from the uh, from the public concerning the application? Yes, sir. Come on, come up to the podium and state your name and address. And hello, my name is Byron Castro. I live at 185 Fowler Road, two houses down. Um, I will give her the compliments. Yes, I haven't heard any noises. Everything's been good at this point. Only thing I have for concern is, is I've lived in a neighborhood where home business has been done. It's kind of gone awry. So I have a couple of concerns of, of, that I'd like to address. Um, is there any overnight allowed dogs to be staying overnight? Obviously, if you have four or five dogs staying overnight, that's going to be an issue that anybody would have, I think, with with the plan. What I understand it isn't, doesn't sound like it is, but I want to make sure that that gets addressed as a, a, a idea or a problem that can go arise. Um, for traffic, I haven't seen any increase of traffic for her at all. I think I've had more traffic than she has. And I'm, <laughs> we don't have a, that big of, <laughs> uh, it's mostly family. So I'm, I'm saying on the car issue, I don't think there is one on that point. But my biggest concern is, is this becoming a kennel or, you know, having large amounts of dogs where it becomes more than just a, a small business. One or two dogs, you know, having a couple dogs, done guiding eyes for the blind in our family also. You get more than a couple dogs or three dogs or so, you're going to have barking. And again, I haven't had any issues, but I want to make sure that this is addressed before we get this home business then it gets going a little bit bigger, a little bit bigger, and we've, I've run into this on another home business. I just hate to see that happen and we open the doors is my only concern, as I think it would be anybody's concern you have to ask. You know, you, you know smells and stuff. And what I, I didn't know, and I'm sorry, I didn't get to find out a little bit more before now, but I think these are questions that have to be addressed anytime you have animals that, you know, we gotta look at, is this opening a door to a bigger thing? Hopefully it will be a bigger thing and then she'll be able to maybe start a bigger business or something, but you know, in a residential area, I'd like to see a home use be exactly what it's supposed to be, small, not invasive for the rest of the neighborhood. Thank you very much. Chair, if I may. Yes. I, I just note the criteria for home business. One, uh, <clears throat> number three says that the business shall not produce noise in excess of that produced by normal residential use. So if it did go beyond that, it would the use would be falling outside of a home business right. use at that point. Again, what you usually do in those circumstances, it has to go through a large, and it's already open the doors and the target. So that's what my impression is. Understood. That's why we have a code enforcement officer. Right there. Thank you again for your comments. Any other comments from the public? Okay, thank you. I have a question for the applicant. Yes. Ms. Could you come up to the podium again, please? Would you be comfortable with a restriction uh, barring the overnight boarding of? Absolutely. I have no interest in it. Right. Now, and as far as the limiting of the number of dogs, would you have a problem with the limitation there? I do not. I schedule. I do my own schedule. I'll stick to what you say. And so when, um, Owners bring their dogs by, they stay with the dog, or do they drop the dog off? Oh, they stay with the dog. So, so nobody's dropping their dog off at 9 a.m. and then it's staying there? No, no, absolutely. Uh, that would be impossible for me to do the job that I need to do. Okay. So. so you don't have boarding capabilities? No, and I don't want them. <laughs> Anything else for the applicant? Thank you very much. And also, I got a, a no signage as one of the conditions. Well, let's 
do you you don't? Uh, I've you never know, had a sign. Have signage, are you? No, never had one. Don't intend to have one. Thank you. So, do you, so the process. How do I? Do you? Oh, we're we're, we're going to discuss it amongst ourselves and okay. vote on your application. Okay. Right now. Let's okay. And you, you'll know when, you'll know in a little bit. Um, okay, so uh, well, there's no other public comment. I asked the question. Let me ask it again. No. Okay. <laughs> uh, so I guess we'll uh, do our board deliberation here, and um, I think Chris, thank you for walking us through the definitions of the uh, the home occupation and uh, criteria and. Uh, I, I think we've basically satisfied ourselves that it, it does qualify as a as a home business uh, under the under the ordinance. Um, uh, under the the RA um, zoning, um, there is an uh, accessory use for a home business, so it's it's uh, it's allowed under the RA district. Um, you know, I. I I think as far as this, the standards of conditional use, um, I think subject to kind of maybe some of the limitations we want to put in place that, um, you know, I'm, I'm generally satisfied that, that um, you know, the business would meet those. I, I would want to put a limitation on uh, some of the things that, that Mr. Castro mentioned, um, but, um, limitation on the number of uh, vehicles per day, um, you know, a no boarding condition. Uh, uh, you know, I, 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 I don't think we want it to be a kennel. I think there is a sensitivity to barking noise, you know, too much barking. And despite what the ordinance says, I think that uh, it sounds as though um, uh, Ms. Hickok is, you know, basically limiting this to you know, a dog per visitor. So it's, you know, I, th I think there's probably a, a conditional condition we want to put there. Um, so, uh, you know, assuming we can, you know, do that, I'm, I'd be I'd be supportive of the application. And the only additional one would be the uh, point about uh, uh, not operating on at least one weekend day and perhaps limiting the business to five days a week in total. Uh, well, I guess the question: uh, Do we know what the hours are right now? Do you believe it? Not, oh, yes, ten, ten to five. And we are held ten, ten to five Saturday, Sunday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday. Okay. So Mondays are off. And just to leave flexibility as to which days during the week, I would say five days a week maximum of which one may be a weekend or explicitly say uh, not in Sundays off limits or something similar. So, yeah, so five, yeah, five, five days a week, um, which, which may include to one weekend day um, between the hours of 10 and 5. Anyone else have thoughts as far as either the application generally or uh, any restrictions they may want to put uh, on it if it were to be approved? Heard no signage as part of that. Okay. Yeah. Um, just under that, uh, we've been spending quite a bit of time on this one, uh, so I'll be brief. Under the home business, there's a provision under paragraph 6. It says all, sign, all signs shall comply with sign ordinances. So one could argue that she has the right to have a sign, and that right can only be within the, um, uh, within the sign ordinance. 
unless we're saying that we are within the discretion of the board to restrict it, carve out that right. So I'm just saying that I don't think the sign came up, but I'm just putting that out of the way. Well, the sign came up only that we asked the question whether she planned to have signage or not. The answer was no. She should have as a restriction. It's a residential area. <coughs> I think it's proper to make it, <coughs> make it a restriction. And then if she wants to add a sign in the future, she could always come back and request a change at that point. It could be revisited. Okay. So uh, I guess with, um, with that said, um, Does someone want to make a motion um, around the application with the restrictions we've talked about? Chris? That's this one we need Joanna. Yeah. <laughs> <It's> not here. <laughs> I move that we grant the request for a conditional use permit with uh, the additional conditions placed of um, that the business may be may operate a maximum of five days a week, one of which may include a weekend day, and that it operate between uh, the hours of 10 and 5, that there be no overnight boarding of customer animals, and that there be no signage. And did I miss any additional uh, criteria? Uh, it's probably left on, I mean, it's in the ordinance, but we're, the, the vehicle traffic. The need to five visitors a day. Which is the duplicative of the which is the, the which is the ordinance. So it's um, the only other I guess question I have is whether we want to limit the number of vehicles that could actually you know client vehicles that could be there at a given point in time. With so to continue my motion with the conditions I laid out so far and the additional condition of no more than one client vehicle at a time. Well, that's a painful delay. Well, I, I guess if, if you're saying one, you know, if you're saying one client um, is 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 there per visit, then I suppose, well, I suppose you get that cover either by. Limited, 10 trips per day in a way. Right? You indirectly get there that way. Although technically all of the clients come at 10 a.m. You'd, you'd have five additional dogs just the additional period and you'd have eight dogs there until the end of the day. Five, 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 five. Yeah, I guess that's yeah, exactly. So I guess the point is to try to avoid that year restriction. Yeah, I think we're trying to avoid a situation where you've got you know, five cars on Fowler Road at a given point in time. It's a situation that's never going to happen because there's only one person dealing with it. No, I, I understand. But, so you, but I think, I, no, I think it's useful to have the restriction that, but I, I just wouldn't want to have the restriction prohibit an incoming dog and an outcoming dog it's overlap. The, it's that transitory uh, right. nature. That's a question. Yeah. So we're saying that would not be allowed, but um, Mr. Carver's concern is the situation where client A is showing up as cli or client B is showing up as client A is leaving, and there's overlap for five minutes. Well, why would you? Why would you do that? Oh, a bit because uh, there would be appointments during the day. The, um, client A would show up for an appointment from nine to nine to four. Or not, let's choose smaller from nine to ten, and client B shows up for an appointment from ten to eleven. So even though only one client's being seen at any instance, there is a period of time when both vehicles are there. Briefly. I'm less concerned with the overlap. I'm I'm, I'm concerned more with all five clients. Yeah, right. It, 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 it sounds as though it's a practical. It, it's not it's not a reality in this particular case. But, but we should still have it. It's so, like scope creep. You know, it, it could be down the road. So I'd rather just avoid. You know, five cars are there dropping off five dogs. The owners stay or they don't stay, whatever, but you've got yeah, no more than two. Well, that's, I'm happen. kind of thinking you've got no more than two client vehicles would be there at any given, you know, at, at, at any given time. So uh, then I would amend my motion 
from no more than one client at a given time to no more than two client vehicles at a given time. I guess then, is there a second? Motion is Um, is a second. Any further discussion? So I'll just I'll just recap the conditions. I've got um, the businesses open between five uh, five days a week, um, with with one 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 day of which can be a weekend between the hours of ten and five p.m. Uh, no overnight boarding of the dogs, no signage, uh, no more than two client vehicles. Um, uh, at the business at any given time. And the only part I'd note is just for <laughs> to avoid any confusion, no overnight boarding of the customer's animals, so obviously her dogs can remain overnight. Wow. That would be unfortunate. Yes. <laughs> Um, all those in favor of the motion? Any opposed? Very vote. So that's six zero. Okay. Um, I also want to put in here that the business does does meet or does satisfy the home uh, the home occupation criteria of the zoning ordinance. Uh, we've got that at uh, number under the findings. Oh, okay, we do. Okay. Um, Technically, we still need to vote on. Right. Understood. And we probably also need to vote on the uh, conditional use. I, I, that was my, my motion was to grant a conditional use. Okay. Motion. Subject to. Subject to those conditions. Okay. Okay, so let's uh, go through the findings of the fact. Uh, this is a request of a conditional use permit for a home business at 181 Fowler Road, Matthew 44, Lot 32. Robert and Gail Hickok are the owner of record for Matthew 44, Lot 32. The proposal is consistent with the definition of home business under Section 19.1.3 of the Town of Cape Elizabeth Zoning Ordinance. The proposal satisfies the requirement of Section 19.5.5 conditional use permit. Operating between the hours of 10 to 5 p.m., there's no. Cover that one. Sorry. Um, but technically, the home business ordinance is censor is any noise that exceeds that of um, regular residential. Okay. 
everything. I think there's, there are parameters in place. Thank you. What, we have another one? <laughs> okay. Uh, I guess that now brings us back to um, the administrative appeals. And where we left off was the uh, Murphys were going to uh, come up and uh, speak to us concerning uh, standing. Good evening. My name is Richard Bryant, and I represent um, Mick and Deborah Murphy. And I apologize for being a little late getting here this evening. I had a little computer issue, which I think I've resolved. We got work done, so it's, it's okay. A little bit, a little bit. Um, I, I did miss the initial uh, introduction to this appeal, but I understood from my client that you wanted to address standing issues first. Um, and in that regard, I do have one further document that I want to make sure I can pass out to you. Actually, two documents. They may be in your, <clears throat> uh, they're certainly in the files already from the previous handling of the previous appeal, uh, but I will hand them out anyway just to make sure we have the, the record straight uh, in terms of standing. So the items I'm passing out now are just a copy of the plan of Shore Acres from the Registry of Dates. Uh, Mary, do you need a copy over there? You sit. The second item I wanted to pass out is a, <coughs> is a deed that's uh, the original deed out of the uh, Shore Acres Land Company for lot 38, which is the lot that the Murphys now own. I think already in your uh, in the appeal, there's a copy of the, of the current deed into the Murphys for that lot 38. But this has specific language about an easement. I want to make sure that the board sees that as well. Pardon me a moment. So addressing the standing issues, you have um, before you, as you had before you many, many months ago when this board first heard uh, uh, the Murphy's appeal, the Goldman uh, building permit by the prior code enforcement officer, um, Information regarding the, uh, the Murphy's uh, ownership of the parcel, which is across Pilot Point Road from the subject parcel, from the Goldman parcel. They're not a, a direct abutter in that sense, but they are kitty corner across Pilot Point Road. However, in addition to having a, deeded, uh, a deed in uh, Shore Acre subdivision, which includes with it an easement in common with other property owners in Shore Acres to all the paper streets shown on the Shore Acres subdivision plan, which includes Surfside Avenue. On the exhibit I passed out, it passes along between the Golden Lot and the ocean. The Murphys are also <coughs> in possession of an appurtenant easement in their deed, which is not implied by reason of their having obtained a lot by virtue of uh, reference to a recorded plan, but also a specific grant of an easement over Surfside Avenue. And that distinguishes them from the public in general, which might have a right uh, should the Paver Street ever become a public way. It distinguishes them from all other lot owners uh, in Shore Acres, who by virtue of having achieved uh, title through a deed referencing a plan, implies that they have an easement over all the streets shown on that plan. Uh, and in the deed I just passed out, you will find uh, in the paragraph just below, uh, just below the numbered paragraph five, there is a right-of-way that's granted in common with others <coughs> in the Shore Acre 
Shoreacres Land Company. Uh, from the lot above described to the town road, notice Tundry road, Trundy Road over the ways as delineated on the corded plan of Shore Acres, which are now constructed or to be constructed, along with, find it here, um, an easement in common with others in said Shore Acres Land Company, its successor is designed over and along Surfside Avenue and Oak Road Road as delineated and recorded on plans of Shore Acres. So that last section of that paragraph does more than just say you have a right to get along paper streets to the public road. That gives a specific right to those specific um, roads as shown on the plan and one of those named roads that they have a deeded right to is Surfside Avenue. And I can tell you having looked at dozens and dozens of uh, titles with respect to other lots in the subdivision, the Murphys are one of a minority of lot holders who have a specific deeded right to Surfside Avenue. Other lot holders in Shore Acres have rights which arise by virtue of the plan, um, but the Murphys have something more than that. So what we have uh, in terms of standing for purposes of municipal appeals of building permits uh, is an extraordinarily low standard. And if you actually look at the remand by the Superior Court uh, of the recent uh, appeal that was uh, sent back to you for de novo review. The court in that case notes that the bar, excuse me, that the standard for standing is a very low bar to meet, um, but does say that if, uh, if the Goldens want to raise that issue that it should be raised. So what we have here is a property owner who has a deeded, specific deeded right in land that's immediately adjacent and downslope of the property at issue. So the runoff, which is affected by the uh, impervious surface on that lot, flows from that lot onto their deeded easement right. So if <clears throat> there were some circumstance in which the Goldman's uh, directly diverted water onto that easement that they have a right in, or otherwise directed pollution or excess runoff onto that easement. My contention is that the Murphys would have a right to go to court to bring an individual trespass action against the Goldmans for Im imposing upon their property, that is their deeded interest rights in the right of way. So I don't think I need to show anything more than that. As I said, the case law is very clear that the, that the bar for standing is very low. Uh, you simply have to be, in most cases, have to show that there's some uh, proximity to the uh, property at issue. Uh, and in this case, we can show more than that. We can show direct abutting uh, ownership interest. We can show that the purpose of the, uh, of the ordinance which we're attempting to enforce is to protect uh, against runoff from the property, which is upslope from us. Uh, and I think that that solves the standing issue. But I'm happy to answer any questions anyone has about that. Uh, just a uh a couple of questions from me. So uh, on the on the map you handed out, Mr. Bryant, where is the Goldman's, or give, me, give me the lot number of the Goldman's property and the Murphy's property? Right. I wish I had uh, this blown up. Uh, it's on my computer someplace and I can get it up on the screen, I hope, in a bit, but I didn't think we'd necessarily need I it. I see yet. Surfside Ave, if that helps. Right. Surfside Avenue is along the bottom of the, of the map. That one we've got. <clears throat> Uh, and you see something called Oak Grove Road, yes. which is the road above that. That is now Pilot Point Road. Right, cut that one. And the lot number that the Murphy zone is lot number 38, which is uh, the third lot from the left of Wombeck Road, which uh, you see cuts north from uh, Oak Grove Pilot Point. Left. 55. So three. And like I say, that map <coughs> and the reference to this, references to the specific lots were also shown, uh, presented in the original appeal that, that is in the town's okay. records. So we think we found, so the Goldman's are 17 or, well, which one would the Goldman's be? 
Actually, Mary, I'm going to ask you to help me on that. I don't have it right in front of me. I, it's much easier for me to look at the zoning map and show you on the zoning map, but they're essentially kitty corner. Um, I believe it is, I believe it's 17 and 4. And you uh, said, Mr. Bryant, that the Murphy's deed specifically references Surfside app? Yes. In what happens is the deed into the Murphy's references lot 38, as shown on the plan. That's the, that's the, the current deed into the Murphy's themselves. Yeah. The right of way is an appurtenant easement. The appurtenant easements travel with the fee interest of the benefiting property, even if they're not mentioned in the deed. What I provided to you is the original deed which creates that appurtenant easement coming out of Shore, Acre Land, Shore Acres Land Company um, to, I think it's called Bragdon Paint Company. I don't have it. But, but the Murphy's deed is referencing this? The Murphy's deed. As opposed has, to a specific reference to Surfside Ave in their deed, just so I'm clear. That's correct. The chain of title is such that the Murphy's deed shows that they have lot 38. General title law in the state of Maine makes clear that if you, that if you obtain title by a description of a parcel in which you obtain the fee interest, that all the pertinences that benefit that parcel travel along, along with it, whether or not it's mentioned. So you don't have to repeat all of the appurtenances down through 100 years of chain of title every time you deed somebody a lot. Um, instead, you can deed them lot number X, and if a previous title holder had obtained a specific easement that benefited that lot, then that's automatically passed along to you as a matter of title law. But does their deed, again, I assume their deed does reference? Lot 38 in the plan, and it actually references the deed that came into their predecessor. And you have to go back several uh, links in the chain of title to get the original deed out of uh, the Shore Acres Land Company. Any other questions for uh, Mr. Bryant? Could you um, explicitly spell out, um, to use the language from the Superior Court's opinion, the nature of the injury suffered by the Murphys? Well, what we have is the Superior Court's order saying that the z -Bear has already found the Murphys have standing to contest the issuance of the permit. So you voted unanimously that there was, I believe, unanimously last time. I think we went 4-3 uh, last time. Okay, I thank you. 4-3. I, I was in the 4. You were in the 4, thank you. But nevertheless, uh, as... By majority vote last time, you voted <laughs> that they had standing. I, uh, Nevertheless, the court asks that um, the nature of the injury be further developed. So if you can explicitly spell out what the nature of that injury is. And I will tell you the nature of the injury is that they have a, a deeded, specific deeded interest in a right-of-way that is downslope from a property which they contend is violating the shoreland zoning maximum impervious coverage uh, regulations, which will result in additional runoff and pollutants flowing from the Goldman property across their deeded right-of-way. Will that in any way impinge on their ability to travel on that easement? It's a matter of degree. It may and it may not. What's I, what I think is important is that the Murphys have an interest in that property that's entirely distinct from the public at large. So like I say, if the Goldmans pushed waste over the edge of their property and onto that right-of-way, we would have a specific, we would have a right to sue for trespass for them impairing our right-of-way. So I, I would definitely agree with you that they have a, um, a property interest that's distinct from the public at large. But we also need to show what the nature of the injury is to that property interest. And you're saying um, theoretical runoff that might or might not occur. Well, I'd say it, there are actually probably other um, injuries that one could articulate. 
among them might be aesthetic uh, uh, concerns. Part of the shoreland zoning ordinance talks about uh, visual access along the shore and by place, by removing what were some very discrete steps uh, from the upper portion of the Goldman property down to where the um, path, where the right of way is for the Murphys, Surfside Avenue, that's now been replaced with a pretty large and imposing uh, set of steps which are beyond uh, the limitations set forth in the shoreland zoning ordinance for steps leading down to the shore. And just to be clear, because you phrased it as almost a hypothetical, are the Murphys asserting that is in fact an injury that they have uh, suffered? We can ask them. Okay. They're nodding. Yes, indeed. Yeah. Okay. Chair, I have a question. Yes, sir. Before my time on this board was as of January, so I am unaware of the prior aspects. So perhaps you can enlighten me on a couple of features. Has the applicant, the Murphys, exercised their rights of this easement prior to this type of dispute? Yes. And how did they do that? They walked on the easement, they traveled up and down the easement by themselves and with guests. So that section of the, pro of, of the shoreline is, the reason I said it, I'm looking at a, on the Google Maps. Mm -hmm. And so it, I guess we can talk further about what, a, what is a paper street. Um, we're talking on the rocks at the shoreline, or we're talking the width of the road as if it's a hypothetical street that they're just walking through, but it's actually woods and debris and up and down terrain. Well, the nature of Surfside Avenue changes as you travel along it. There are some places where, I, where it is um, overgrown, and there are other places where it is an open lawn. And there are some places where it is a cliff because the ocean has eroded into Surfside Avenue. So, for me, I'm, I'm trying to tease out of you some information that will be helping us determine sure. the, the, the issue of standing. Because I think there's a, uh, um, trying to understand the, the, the type of right on a paper street and whether your clients exercise their rights anywhere along this paper street. So for example, did they complain when other people uh, butted the paper street, did something that may have interrupted their right? Yes. <clears throat> yes, How they did have. they do that? Uh, they were involved in the abutting property, which also was the subject of a very, very long, excuse me, several very, very long ZBA hearings before this board <clears throat> with respect to improvements that were placed within Surfside Avenue by that abutter. On the map that you handed out, which house number, which lot number would that be? Um, very hard to read here, but I believe it is 18 and is that 3, I believe. It's the property that's uh, easterly along the shoreline, the next abutting property. Chair, may I approach the lectern for a moment? Sure, yes. Okay, here, let me show. I've got a <coughs> got another document which will show which should orient you much more easily. And this is a copy of the of a Google map, um, part of the Shoreland uh, zone. Uh, with lot lines as shown from the town's zoning map. And what you will see, and I will hand these out so I, so I can demonstrate here. Um, this is the Golden property. The property next to the Livingston property, which was the subject of various other appeals. And the Murphys live here. I have copies of this to hand out. Um, 
So this is the Goldman property. I'm going to give you the exact move of this. <clears throat> Immediately next door is the Livingston property that was subject to an earlier appeal, a separate appeal, which is still on appeal in fact. Um, and the Murphys live, I believe, in this house here. So they're not directly across the street, but they are nearby. And Surfside Avenue runs along here. The bottom of the Golden property is Surfside Avenue. So that's on Surfside Avenue. Just to follow up on this point, but for these two properties, it looks like lots 18 and, and number 3 on the handout that you gave us. Mm -hmm. Have the Murphys questioned the use or inter and, um, uh, encroachment on the easement that's called Surf Surfside Avenue? Uh, but for those two, those two property owners there, number, thir number 3 and number 18, anywhere else along Surfside Avenue have they complained and question people using uh, the easement? Um, they certainly talked to me about it. I'm not, it's not a matter of, of uh, when you said using the easement, I take it you're not talking about others using the easement for access. Are you... No, I, I want to develop the point that you made, right. that they're objecting to a potential use of the easement, the ornamental stairs. So if the, um, uh, the Murphys had standing and other proceedings and actions dealing with Surfside Avenue that may help us talk about this particular application for standing purposes. Yes, they have participated in other uh, appeals. Again, the adjacent property is the nearest one. So far as I know, there have not been other zoning board appeals of other uses of Surfside Avenue. However, they have regularly used Surfside Avenue and when others have questioned their right to do so, they have asserted, no, we have a right to be here and we're going to exercise those rights. Um, I guess I would point out one last thing related to the aesthetics, but it really, it goes back to economics, which a lot of real estate does, is that when people, when the Murphys sell their house, one of the things they're selling is not just the house and the lot that they have, but that access right, that deeded access right upon Surfside Avenue. And to the extent that that is impaired in any way, whether aesthetically or otherwise, that affects the price that someone theoretically is willing to pay for their property. So it's not simply aesthetics that translates into economics at the end of the day. Any other questions for Mr. Bryant? Do the Murphys allege that the stairs have impacted their, uh, the peacefulness of the neighborhood and their enjoyment of their lot, of the easement? Um, the peacefulness of the easement? I'm not quite sure what that means. I know there's been an awful lot of controversy that's arisen because of these stairs. Quoting a line from the, the SJC case um, cited by the Superior Court. Um, it is certainly the, the presence of that <coughs> um, new construction has certainly affected their enjoyment of the easement. It has certainly affected their relationships with their neighbors on all sides of the issue. My question is whether the project, the alterations has, according to the Murphys, impacted the peacefulness of the, 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 uh, the area from, the, from an aesthetic standpoint, from the, the quiet. Yes, I would say it certainly changed the area in that regard. And I also say that in exercising their rights along that easement, now they are regularly challenged by uh, property owners. In photo two, it appears there's there's a lot of shrubbery here, so I was just wondering if you could explain how, if at all, the Murphys were traveling along. I, I assume this is in the Paper Street. In photo two, do you have photo two? Yeah, I might have that in another place. I can take a look at that one. Then. That would be nice. Thank you. 
I think photo two in uh, Mary Costigan's or her client would be much uh, um, better suited to articulate exactly where this was taken, but my understanding is that this was taken probably very close to the property line, um, and it may well indeed show a portion of the Surfside Avenue right away. I would say that it does, but I didn't take the photo, so I just can't say in that regard. It, it just appears, I, I was assuming that this um, pathway here that ends in all the shrubbery was the paper street, and that was what was depicted. So if I've got it wrong, hopefully someone will correct me. Yeah. Well, it's, it's, I believe it's within the paper street, but again, I have to let <coughs> Mary, well, she's nodding at me now, indicating that that's a... So as I say, the paper street has not been developed. That's why it's a paper street. Uh, some sections are, uh, have more vegetation than, than others. Um, and it is true that the Murphys have not decided to go down and place a path you know, physically hack out vegetation but uh, along the paper street, but that's in part because that sort of activity is very highly regulated because it's in the shoreland zone. And they can't do it without uh, seeking approval from the town first. So they've exercised the rights they can without, um, without having to go through uh, any municipal regulatory approval. Is the nature of their injury a, a, a hypothetical or is there an actual injury that has been sustained or is being sustained? Well, I would argue that it, there's actual injury that's been sustained and I would say that that injury is a decrease in the value of their property. I would say it is a, a deprivation of the enjoyment of Surfside Avenue right of way because of the aesthetics that are <clears throat> result from uh, having to pass by this as they're going down to access the, the ocean side. Um, and finally, I would say that to the extent that there is unfortunately ill will in the neighborhood associated with um, their attempts to exercise the rights upon their Surfside Avenue, that that also is an, an actual existing, existing harm that they've suffered. You said a decrease in the, in the property value? Yeah, as I said, if I'm going to buy the Murphy's house and I know I've got a deeded right along Surfside Avenue and I walk along Surfside Avenue, one of the things that is going to say, gee, what's this worth if, if I have to look at this rather than uh, look at, an, at a green belt type path? It's akin to the fact that when people are acquiring property in Oakhurst, it comes with a deeded right to, I believe this is accurate, to Casino Beach. And for some people, that carries value. Obviously, Casino Beach, one would say, might be more valuable than this paper street. But. Yes. I'm not a real estate appraiser. Do you have a backup to that comment that would be worth less money? Do you have an appraisal or an opinion of that? I certainly do not have an appraisal. I can tell you that I've been a real estate attorney for going on 30 years now. You don't have any real, you really have no background on how to appraise what the value would be. Um, do you? Well, I, I will tell you that under Maine law, it's clear that owners of property have the ability, as, <clears throat> just as well as any appraiser, to give a value of opinion of their property. And I can tell you from my experience, having in, been involved in both commercial and residential real estate transactions for going on three decades now, that it is the case that a pertinent easements affect the value of the property, sometimes greatly, sometimes only minimally. But okay, they but affect don't, value. I don't have a document on that, okay? Pardon? But you don't have a, you haven't documented that with a real estate. No, I've certainly not gone out to, to get an appraisal of this right of way. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Bryant. Good evening, board members. My name is Mary Costigan. I'm with the firm of Bernstein Shore, and I'm here tonight representing Kathy and Marshall Goldman in this appeal. So let's just start at the beginning with this standing issue, is that first they need to be an aggrieved party. 
And what does that mean? They, as you discussed, they need to show a particularized injury. I did not hear anything tonight that's an injury, nor a particularized injury. Um, they claim to have a unique standing among the neighborhood by having this easement across a uh, paper street. Well, as you may be aware, you're probably all aware that anyone in that subdivision has the same rights. It is not a unique right to set aside. The, their easement language in their deed only says a right of way in common with others. That is not unique. There is also an easement in the neighborhood that is a recreational easement that actually provides even more access than just a, a right of way. It's the right and easement in common with another to travel by foot and use for passive recreation over uh, Surfside Avenue. That easement applies to 71 lots in the neighborhood. The Murphys is not one of them. So they do not have any unique use of this easement, of this paper street. In addition to the private rights over the paper street, there is, of course, the public rights of incipient dedication that someday, I don't know how in the world it would happen, but the town of Cape Elizabeth could build a road there, and I have just as much of a right um, to access that road as they do. So that goes to the particularity of their injury. Um, and now just to talk about their injury in, in, in general, as they claim. Um, is on the right. And you are correct that the shrubbery here is right in the middle of um, Surfside Avenue. There is no obligation by any of these property owners to maintain that area in a way that allows access. Um, the, Marsh, the Goldmans happen to clear that area, but they're not obligated to in any way. Um, and looking in the other direction, you'll see that there are also uh, obstructed areas of that um, easement. And notably, um, as you're looking in that direction, you don't see the stairs. It's because the stairs in no way impede their right to travel over that area. The stairs are located over 20 feet away from that easement area. And now looking in the other direction, the ocean is on our right and the stairs are on the left and you can see the stairs. The right of way is also a little bit further here. We, we took this picture from a little bit further up, so the right away that is actually on that side of the bushes that way. But you can just see how far away the stairs are and it, how it in no way impedes their use of that area. Can, can I ask you a quick question? Uh, I can wait, but... Okay, uh, so on that, if you stay with photo three, sure. to the right of the bush, mm -hmm. it looks like a path. It's your thumb. Uh, yes. yes. And, and does that... Okay, so, so what's the house? Is, is that the Goldman's house that you see on the right on photo two? No, that's the house. That's the, the Livingston's. No, that's the other version. Yeah. The opposite side of the Livingston. Oh, I'm on the wrong side. Okay. Okay, so is Surfside Ave, does it have, is there any clear access um, that, run, that runs across no. the, 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 all the lots? It's obstructed in various places. As Mr. Bryant said, that some areas are at lawn, other places have the shrubbery, as you see in, in two, but you, you, you cannot get on what is laid out on the subdivision plan of Surfside Avenue and just and walk a straight line and not... But I, but I could walk street. Surfside Ave unimpeded by shrubbery. I mean, I'd have to pick my spots, but I could do it, as opposed to I'm blocked off by a wall of shrubbery. Can you, can you access it from the east end? back in parts of it, but... You, you couldn't walk the entire length, but could you access it from the eastern end to the Goldman's property, I guess is the question. No, is what I'm hearing. 
from those who are familiar with that area. And now let's go to the, the stairs themselves, the allegation that, that this is somehow visually offensive and will decrease a property value of a property that's diagonally across the street. I strongly disagree with the fact that there would be any injury um, as a result of these stairs. So Number one is you're looking at these stairs, your back is to the ocean. So if the argument is you're out there to that right of way allows folks to go out and observe the ocean, you're not looking at these stairs. So here's my fundamental problem that I've struggled with both previously and now mm -hmm. in that it's, for me, it's very close on whether they're standing, but I err on the side of standing because I'd like to have the arguments mm -hmm. heard here. In this instance, if instead that area above the stairs, the code enforcement officers do a spectacular job, he makes a mistake one day and he allows a tennis court to go in, becomes impervious surface for that entire area right above the stairs. Under the argument that I'm hearing, no one could ever challenge that. Is that correct? And I guess th that just seems, that, that seems wrong to me. That basically we would be adopting a position that no one in the town could in any way challenge an error made by the CEO because of the fact that the lot happens to be sitting against, against the, the ocean and no one is downhill from the lot. Number one, we're not talking about tennis court. Um, number two... Uh, just to take what the, the argument, what the, the, the argument eventually leads yeah. us to. Number two, I don't think that anyone would have standing on the basis of interference with use of a right of way. There may be a different argument. The Livingstons or the neighbors on the other side may have a different argument, but I don't believe that you would be able to have standing about what's going on in that property by ver that does not interfere with your right to, all they have is a right of way. That, it's, and they live directly across the street. They live diagonally across the street. But they are, they are in, if you measured from one corner of the lot to the other, they're under 100 feet away from the lot. So, uh, right, but, but we're not but, talking about tennis courts. Go ahead, go ahead and finish. We're, okay. Thank you. We won't interrupt you again. All right, let, no, me just, <laughs> <laughs> let me just try to see, make sure I got everything here. We do, we do agree that it's a low threshold, but I really don't, I don't see how anyone is injured by these steps. And that's all we're talking about. We're talking about steps. We're not talking about any hypothetical pollution pour or any hypothetical injury or obstruction to that easement area. And I just find it hard to, it's a door that you're gonna blow off the hinges by allowing this appeal. The precedent that you're setting is very, very low. It, it's going to, you're essentially allowing someone who, to appeal just by virtue of living in the neighborhood. And that's not enough. There is no injury from these steps whatsoever that could possibly be alleged. Chair, if I may. I, I, you? I just want to make sure I got all my notes and then I'll yep. answer questions. Good time. I just, I do want to point out, Mr. Bryant uh, talked a little bit about um, the, the fact that they, there isn't a, a path there, but if they wanted a path, they could build a path. And I, it's, a, it's just a, a, a bit ironic to me that the concern is stormwater runoff, but they're interested in building a path. So I just wanted to point that out, that in the interest of stormwater runoff, the best thing for that area is to keep the shrubbery and not have a path. So now I can answer some questions. You sure? I'm sure, <laughs> yes. Um, uh, could you just um, maybe explain for me what, why, um, why it's necessarily a, a low standard 
that, that has to be met to kind of achieve standing in a situation like this? Well, the, the law court has held that as an abutter, um, you need to show, and I have the exact language, a reasonable allegation of a potential for a particularized injury. Um, and I think, you know, your, your typical abutter concerns are things like traffic and noise and things like that that come from some sort of more invasive construction other than a set of steps. Go ahead, Chris. At the end of the day, the issue we have here is that a um, kitty corner across the street of Butter is attempting to enforce what they believe is a violation of the Shoreland Zoning Ordinance. Uh, th this is a, uh, a protection that exists both at the town level and at the state level. Mm -hmm. And what you're asking us to say, I understand the, if, if we construe it as we're saying anyone in the neighborhood can challenge it based on this um, somewhat vague easement right that's granted to others. One could argue that it says others because they didn't want to iterate every lot in shore acres. But as you noted, it could just be other, others in the sense of the public in general. That argument, eh, but the argument that their kitty corner abutters, they're so close. If they are not the ones that can enforce it, a mistake or an over, oversight by the CEO for a violation of the shoreland zone, then who can? They still have to show an injury. I, I can, I live in Falmouth, I love shoreland zoning, I want to enforce it everywhere, but I'm just as injured as they are by any violation anywhere because it has no impact on their property or on them, on the easement, on anything, none. So you don't believe that, uh, that because they have uh, a deed, effectively a deeded right away, that um, somehow uh, the placement of those granite steps, or I guess the existence of the granite steps, negatively impacts their property values. Or Not at all. Or impacts that, that deeded right away. Not at all. It, it, they, it may, in fact, increase their property value because it's so well maintained. But we don't know. We don't know. It depends on who the buyer is. We don't know that either. We don't know that either. Although my understanding is that the, the test is whether the person who has appeared before the board, when the person who has appeared before the board is in a butter, a reasonable allegation of a potential for particularized injury is all that is necessary to establish the real controversy required for adjudication in a court. That's right, yep. So the question is, have we reached the threshold of a um, potential for a particularized injury? It's the potential for a particular life. That word potential is in there. So. I mean, isn't, isn't there the potential that the stairs will cause additional runoff that will cause the road, the paper road, to erode? And now they will no longer have access to the paper road? No. Those, the, the stairs are very minimal. We're not taught, maybe if it was a tennis court, but not with steps with grass landings. No. But it's just the potential. But there's still no potential. Would you agree it's potential that uh, someone might not like these stairs and um, if there is a change in market forces such that people begin to value undeveloped uh, land, the, the shrubbery, the, the grass, the, the natural state that having these stairs would impact uh, property values in the area? Would you agree that's the potential that may occur? No, because usually potentials are based on reality. <laughs> Any other questions? I have a few, but uh, Chris has exhausted his questions. questions over and over. So <laughs> if you're not prepared to talk on these points, please let me know. Sure. I'll, I'll move on to the next one. What is a paper street? A paper street is a street that exists on a subdivision plan, but has not yet been developed as a street. And was that the case here? Yes. Who owns Surfside Avenue? The Goldmans own the fee to Surfside Avenue, subject to easements of others to cross. Right. Um, thank you. Why does uh, adverse possession does not apply here? There's, because there's nothing to adversely possess. So how can we say that, um, that the Murphys have a claim to enforce their easement? 
I'm not following. I'm sorry. So if the underlining owner mm -hmm. is Goldman right. Party, and they have allowed an easement, and for whatever, not just the Murphys, but all the people that may have, um, sorry, not just this particular property, but Surfside Avenue in general, mm -hmm. um, why is that easement still effective? How do you protect an easement? That's a good question. I also don't differentiate between the easement rights and the, the paper street rights. To me, they're one and the same. They, all they do is grant a, a right of way across the paper street. And the paper street rights may or may not still exist. I mean, those are, so those are still, those are questions. I, yeah. In, uh, uh, I'll wait. So uh, ju just uh, to touch on some of the things like, so about a year and a half, I don't remember the exact time ago, we had three or four different meetings on a number of these issues. And if I get this wrong, I'm sure the attorneys will uh, correct me. Um, there was considerable, considerable debate as to who owned the paper street at this point, and I believe either the Livingstons or the Goldman, someone was arguing that um, ownership now had reverted to them. Um, I might have that wrong, but I think that was what That's the, correct. The, the sides disagreed as to who owned it. Uh, at the end of the day, it was raised. We didn't get into it. We said we're not even touching that with the 10-foot pole. Um, as to uh, whether it, anyone had ever been restricted from passing on the street, we never got into the um, whether anyone had ever built a fence and kept the public off of this land. So it seems like it's generally accepted that it's just been sitting there so people could go back and forth so that's why there probably wouldn't be the adverse possession because it was never fenced off instead it was people were claiming oh we go on that land and others were saying oh no you don't and then it was the oh i own it others said oh no we own it and you're impinging on our, our rights and we went back and forth for like three or four meetings i don't want to get into uh, a dialogue but I, I query why is there not a declaratory judgment being sought got me <laughs> uh, who mows the lawn on those photos Mr. Goldman may or may not, or he may ask somebody to mow the lawn for him. <laughs> Are there other people along the, um, that abut the Surfside Avenue that mow the lawns and put other structures or? or? And there is, a, and there, the Livingstons do have a, a structure that is in the right of way, but there's a deck right in the middle of that right of way. Uh, no, sorry, no, sir, no. you can take the uh, public method. comment. Thank you. Um, are these lots that abut Surfside Avenue, are they waterfront or water view for tax purposes? Waterfront. My last query, um, what remedies are available to uh, either party uh, if there is or is not standing for the purposes of this application? Remedies in terms of the issue that I'm looking at, uh, we are yeah. considering is the, the minimum requirement yes. for standing. Just a question for yes. the gateway question. Right, exactly. Yeah. Um, I'm troubled by one of the comments made by the judge that there has not been a determination as to the easement itself. And so this is on um, page four. Mm -hmm. The Murphys appear to have easement rights. Right. And that the last, quest, last paragraph, and asked the board to actually consider the easement rights. So I asked one party, I asked now the other party, mm -hmm. what is the right that we're talking about? Right. And, and the, I think there's two parts. One is mm -hmm. there is a right uh, for an easement purpose. And right. And that's one attack or remedy. The other one is the shoreland overlay point for the stairs where it's too close to the water line <clears throat> is the other. Mm -hmm. um, so my concern is that I wanted to ask you directly, do you believe that the Murphys have an easement on Surfside Avenue? I believe they have a deed, an old deed that gives someone an easement, and I believe that there's a subdivision plan that has Surfside Avenue laid out. But you're correct that to, in order to affirmatively resolve that issue, it's not this board's purview, it's for declaratory judgment action. So. We're making assumptions for the purpose of standing, but we're not agreeing that they have absolute rights, that they have an easement, that there's a paper street, none of that stuff. We're making assumptions, and even with those assumptions, we, don't, we think they don't have standing. 
I think we're all hopefully in agreement that we're merely, uh, there's no confirmation that there's an easement right by the termination by the board this evening. That's correct. Okay. I suspect that we'll have caveats and statements of findings <laughs> to that effect. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Do we, uh, oh, Mr. Bryant, would you? I'd like to respond to some of the points that were made because I strongly disagree with a number of them. Um, I do think one of the concerns that we have here is that if the Murphys, who are situated across the street and have specific deeded rights that they can show you a deed for uh, in the downslope property, don't have an interest and don't have standing sufficient to bring the merits of the issue before this board, then nobody ever does. You're right. People don't appeal unless it's a direct abutter or unless somebody tries to place a building on their property. And that's just not the way uh, the system is designed to work. The system is for the Zoning Board of Appeals is designed to make sure that the uh, codes of Cape Elizabeth are properly enforced. And they do that in several ways. The one of the foremost ways is to review the decisions of the code enforcement officer. And the whole reason we're here now, and the reason the Murphys were here a year ago, um, as, and a number of other people were in front of this board for many, many hours, is because the former code enforcement officer was handing out permits he shouldn't have. And your job, I think, at the end of the day is get to the merits of that. That's why the standing issue is such a low bar to meet, according to the courts. I don't have to show a particularized industry excuse me, injury, notwithstanding what uh, Ms. Costigan said. I have to show a reasonable um, uh, allegation of a potential for particularized injury. And I think I've established that. A um, few other points to make here. Uh, the Murphys have used the entire uh, uh, length of Surfside Avenue. Um, and the photograph, which you were concerned about because it showed vegetation um, along the adjacent property, that Vegetation was regularly kept down by the former owners, the camps who owned that property, used to maintain a path there uh, to allow people who had rights in Surfside Avenue to, to use it. <clears throat> so it's your contention that, sir, that, that any of the um, property owners had unimpeded access through Surfside Avenue? It's my contention that my clients who are complaining here have had in the past and exercised rights along the length of Surfside Avenue. And, and they or anybody else could go down to Surfside Avenue and block the length of it? Uh, I'm not sure, or anybody else, but they certainly could because they know they have rights. There have been people recently who have challenged... Physically? physically? There have been incidents recently in which the in which the uh, rights of people walking along that path have been challenged by the property owners above Surfside Avenue, saying, you have no right to be here. It's my land. Get off of here. You have no rights. And the Murphys have said, when that's occurred in their instance, no, I have a right. I have a deeded right to this property. I can be here. Again, I don't think it's, I agree with Ms. Costigan that it's not your purview to make a determination uh, as, to, as a court might as to who exactly has what easement rights there and whether um, those rights have been properly exercised or protected or elapsed or otherwise. I think what you have to note is that there is a legitimate assertion by an abutting property owner that they have a right. And that's backed not just by their saying, gee, I have a right there, but by reference to specific language in deeds recorded in the Cumberland County Registry of Deeds. And that, I think, is all you need to know as to whether there is standing to bring this case. Um, but I will point out another thing that Ms. Murphy just uh, noted to me, is that her, if you look at the, um, at the Google map, I will pass that out so you can see it. This has some overlays on it, but what's important is the Google map, which is behind the transparency on the top there. If you look at the Murphy's property, which is 
kitty corner from the, I guess, directly towards the top of the page across Pilot Point Road from the Goldman property. Their house is actually sited to take advantage of the view over the Goldman lot. So it's not simply that they're in a butter and that they're directly, excuse me, kitty corner across the street, although there may be some overlap of, uh, of a foot or two, but it's also that their property has been improved with a design that uh, is intended to capture the view over the Goldman property. So they have a particular interest in this property and what happens on it. Um, Chair, I have two questions. I'll be brief. Um, I'll ask the same question. Uh, who owns Surfside Avenue? I believe that it may still be Shore Acres Land Company. Thank you. That's an open question, and I, Ms. Costigan is right, is that there are those who assert they own the fee. I do not think the Goldmans own the fee to it. Thank you. Well, my last question is that um, one of the remedies, could it not be removing the stairs or that portion that goes into the Surfside Avenue? I think the remedy has to be that this board has to focus on is whether the Goldman lot exceeds the impervious surface limitation within the shoreland zone. So although Ms. Costigan wants to tell you this is about these particular stairs that are uh, quite near Surfside Avenue, in fact, the issue is that you look at the impervious surface over the entire Goldman lot. That's how the shoreland zoning ordinance works. And your decision is to, is to make clear on the merit, is to decide on the merits whether in fact there's too much impervious service that was triggered by this particular improvement on the Goldman lot. And if so, then the entire lot's in violation. To follow up on that, did, would that assessment include Surfside Avenue, the portion behind the Goldman lot? I'm not quite understanding your question. So if we look at um, Goldman lot excluding Surfside Avenue. So we'll, I don't, I'm not sure of the square footage that we're talking about. Yep. Doesn't that allow um, a smaller footprint? Whereas if you include Surfside Avenue, include, and it is a larger footprint? Uh, no, no. The way the shoreland zoning works is the Goldman's property um, for as a as a uh, as a tax map lot and as a zoning lot does not include Surfside Avenue. And when you're calculating the, the surface improvements on the Goldman lot, you don't take into account at all the land on Surfside Avenue. It's excluded. It's entirely excluded. And if you look at that Google map, the red lines drawn around the, the Goldman property, in fact, in fact, reflect the property lines, which are the same as the tax map lines. So there's potentially two avenues to attack these set of stands. One is what you just described. And the other one is that there's an infringement on the easement. I suppose in theory one could, one could argue that, but that's, the difference is I, no one is contending that the uh, Goldmans are putting up a fence in the middle of Surfside Avenue and preventing people from crossing it. That's not the issue. No, no and, they're asserting ownership of that space by putting their own property on, on the land now currently known as Surfside Avenue. And I don't think that's the case either, because the, the, the stairs themselves, I agree with Ms. Costigan, the stairs themselves are not sited within Surfside Avenue. They're close to it, but they're not on it. This is, has nothing to do with saying that the stairs were sitting in the middle of Surfside Avenue and we can't walk over or around them. It has to do with whether the property that abuts Surfside Avenue, that is upslope from Surfside Avenue, is in violation of the Shoreland Zoning Ordinance limitation on surface, well, two, two limitations. One on impervious surface because they simply stuck too much on there because our prior code enforcement officer gave them a permit that he never should have. The second issue, which also directly relates to the Shoreland ordinance in the shoreland zone as it is an overlay over the Goldman property is that the shore, in the shoreland zone you are not allowed to put stairs to give you access down to the shore that are wider than four feet wide and they, you can only be allowed to do that if you show there's no other practical means of putting those stairs there. And there were existing stairs that were removed we're going to place these here. At this point. Yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah. I, um, a couple other points I'd make that they are not, uh, despite Ms. Costigan's ass assertion, my understanding is that they are not taxed as waterfront lot. They're taxed on 
the tax map lot, which is the same as the zoning lot. They I understand they get a discount because they are of 5% on what otherwise would be the tax because they are separated, their property line is separated from the ocean by uh, Surfside Avenue. Uh, let me see if there's anything else I have here. Chair, if I think. Last question. Okay. As discussed, you, you, you need to sh basically, we have the proximate location of the property for the Murphys, but what we need to have articulated is what the potential for a particular injury is. So if we were going to make a, a finding of facts to support a finding that there is standing, can you iterate for us right now every single uh, potential for a particular injury that we would include in the findings of fact for if God forbid there, there's another appeal of this up to the Superior Court and the, the court reviews the decision. What would be those bullet points of why there is a potential for a particularized injury in this instance? The first and foremost would be the proximity of the, um, of the Murphy's residence, so, so separated only by Pilot Point Road. But what's the, is, proximity doesn't seem to me that gives injury. What, there needs to be a harm that has occurred. But the, go the ahead your list. So what happens is that they are going to be across the street from a, um, a structure, excuse me, a lot which is in violation of the zoning ordinance, which has been improved in violation of the zoning ordinance. Their residence is designed to maintain a view is cited so that the views from their residence are over the Goldman property. So it's not as if they're looking the other way and they never see it. Every time they get up and look out the window, they see the Goldman property. Can that affects... Can they see the stairs from their property? No, they cannot see the sta stairs from their residence. No, they cannot. Can they see the stairs However, from anywhere on their lot? Pardon? Can they see the stairs from anywhere on their lot? I do not believe so. I think the slope is too great to do so. However, the second aspect of this then goes to their rights in Surfside Avenue. They have as part of their property, right, an appurtenant easement, a specific appurtenant easement uh, along Surfside Avenue. And that property right they have in Surfside Avenue is immediately adjacent to, it's not separated by a street, it abuts the Goldman property. Moreover, it is downstream from the Goldman property, downhill from the Goldman property. So if anyone would have an interest in enforcing um, ordinances that relate to runoff from the Goldman property because of the excess of impervious surface over what's allowed under the ordinance, it should be someone who has an interest in the property immediately abutting and downhill from the Goldman property. And that's the Murphys. And that runoff's a hypothetical. N the runoff... I speak that there may be a runoff. I would say no. I'd say the water rains uh, and runoff comes off that property over Surfside Avenue. I'd, What's that based on? It's based on the fact that it's downhill from Surfside Avenue. I mean, it seems downhill from the Murphy lot. There's always some level of runoff that comes from, uh, that crosses boundary lines. Okay. And in fact, you will find in if we ever get to the merits of this appeal, you'll find that there is evidence that there is direction of flow uh, at the site of the stairs towards Surfside Avenue. Again, that's more of the merits. I don't want to is it focus fair, on that. Is it fair to articulate what you just said, not as merely the stairs themselves are what's causing the excessive runoff, but the fact that the coverage permitted, uh, the, the CEO's decision was, I will permit the lot, under your argument, to have more than 20% coverage. Absolutely. Under your position. Absolutely. That it's is not, what's causing the excess of right, it's, rather than the stairs. I don't think I've heard that in his position, but you've made it for him. No, that's absolutely the case. That's what I was trying to articulate earlier, is that the issue here is not the site of these particular stairs. The, ears is, the issue here is that the Goldman lot has too much impervious structure on it, which was allowed because the prior code enforcement officer you know, made an error. He should never have given him a permit for several reasons, but one of them is that there's just too much structure there. Um, the other points you were still, you're asking me to articulate other points, and again, I would talk about economics, which is that part of the value of the Murphy's property, certainly to them, and they believe to someone who would buy from them at the end of the day, is their rights along Surfside Avenue, and whether Surfside Avenue is a uh, relatively um, green, 
uh, area and scenic area or whether there are large structures immediately adjacent to Surfside Avenue. The notion that, gee, you only use Surfside Avenue to look at the ocean, you can ignore what I put behind you when you're looking out at the ocean doesn't make sense to me. Seems to me that just like when you're standing at the beach, if you turn around and there's a, you're in Old Orchard Beach versus being at Reed State Park, there's going to be a different uh, quality to your experience. And that, to me, uh, goes to the value of the easement to the property owner here. Pardon me? Stairs. What was where these stairs were? There there was, you know, I've got plenty of photos to show you. That goes to the merits. I'd love to get to that. We'll show you what was there and the stairs that were replaced, which were hidden and over to the side. Uh, I'd, like to, uh, I'd like to wrap this up. Mm -hmm. okay, one, I, one more question. Okay. We've got to move on. Okay, thank you. What would the Murphys like the Goldmans to do? The Murphys would like the Goldmans to comply with the Cape Elizabeth Ordinance by removing the excess impervious surface from the lot that borders their uh, easement. You mean the stairs? I mean that they ought to have their, the right to make sure that the permit that was granted by the town wrongfully is revoked and any structures that were uh, created in connection with that um, issuance of that wrongful permit should be ordered to be taken down. And I think that's important to note that the Murphys went ahead, excuse me, the Goldmans went ahead and constructed these stairs no, before uh, this issue was finally settled. It was entirely at their risk. Um, it's not a case of an innocent landowner who builds a build, pulls a building permit, the appeals period passed, they build their structure, and then they, then they uh, suffer the risk that later on that permit is pulled. That's not the case we have here. This is a case in which there was a timely appeal and the Goldmans chose to go ahead anyway and invest their money. So there should be no sympathy for the fact that they've invested money in these stairs they shouldn't have put there in the first place. The law doesn't recognize that as a, as a vested right uh, by, the Murphy, by the Goldmans. Thank you, Mr. Bryant. Th thank you, John. I want to follow up. Uh, I'll give you a five-minute rebuttal if you'd like it. Or not. Five seconds is even better. <laughs> I, I, this, our, sta our position on standing is the same. Nothing has changed. But because you went a little bit beyond, I just want to note that you know, the, the, the remedy here and what can happen, and, and this is getting way far ahead, but if the conclusion, which we don't think will happen, but if the conclusion is that there's too much impervious coverage, it doesn't mean the stairs have to be removed. We would just have to meet impervious coverage. So we could choose which impervious coverage to remove. So. Duly noted. Thank you. Do we have any uh, comments from the uh, public? Yes, sir. Come on up to the podium, name and address. Podium. And chair, and the comments are specifically on the standing issue. And sir, one last thing, this should be, your comment should be limited just to, we're just talking about standing. No problem at all. My name is Imad Khalidi. I live in 19 Pilot Point Road, two blocks or two lots from the, from the Goldman's. And I have no problem with those stairs myself. I can walk through the, his land if I want to. He's a neighbor of mine. I'll call him and tell him I'll walk through your land. And those stairs does not bother me whatsoever. That's what I have to say. Thank you. Hi, my name is Deborah Murphy and I live at 24 Pilot Point Road and I just want to say that I do feel that the value of my property is diminished by the fact that there is far too much impervious surface on the Goldman's lot um, and particularly the stairs. I mean, it is, we used to walk down there, the people that owned property there knew that they had to keep the paths open, and they did. And we all got along just fine, and it was lovely. Now you walk down there, and you look, and there's this thing that's huge. And it doesn't look natural, and I do feel that as a property owner, for me, it diminishes the value of my property. Thank you. Okay. I'd like to 
Yes. My name is Andrea Adams. I live at 25 Algonquin Road in Shore Acres. The house that the Goldmans tore down before they built theirs was a piece of crap. They put up a beautiful home. It has only added value to the neighborhood. It has increased the Murphy's property hugely. You cannot see the stairs from the road. I, wrote, I walk the road every day. I've never seen the stairs. You cannot see them from the road. There's no impact whatsoever to the neighborhood. Thank you. Thank you. Any other public comment? I just need to comment on that our property value, that you think that our property value has been improved. Before the Goldman House went up, we had a view of the lighthouse, and we no longer do. So that diminished the value of our property also. Thank you. I'll close the public comment on the standing. Turn it over to the board. <laughs> well, I, I think maybe we should just start by taking a quick type of poll to see in which direction we're going to get a sense. I mean, yeah, I agree. I'm, I'm definitely inclined to find that there is standing. So, uh, I'm, I'm inclined to find that there is standing. This, the bar is very low to find standing, and um, I think that the reasons that have been enumerated achieve that. Um, I mean, we don't need to go over that right now unless we you know, there's some dispute over that, but I think it's, it's low. They have rights to the paper street and the easement, and um, we're talking about a, uh, you know, an increase of the impervious surface that potentially could put it over 20%. That's obviously the substantive issue. But it has nothing to do with stand. Well, but once you're, you're talking about an increase of the impervious surface, which increases the runoff over the paper street, and easement. So got this. That's, that's, that starts to affect the easement. Does it? <laughs> potentially. We, it does, it's not, it doesn't have to absolutely affect it. Could it potentially? Is there the potential that it will that there will be an injury, that there will be harm? Potentially, yes. Is that word potential in the yeah. test? Is the word reasonable? Very that's true. the word reasonable. Not the potential. Let's get to the first word. Start with that word. What's the exact? Uh, Reasonable allegation for potential particularized injury. That is the law. It may be a low threshold. It is still a threshold. It's still a threshold. The reason is there a reasonable allegation? But, but you know, and without without uh, getting without jumping uh, ahead to the the actual merits, I mean. There's a shoreland zoning ordinance, which has a 20% figure for a reason. And that is because there has been a determination that at some point when you get beyond 20%, there is obviously some potential harm once you get up to and beyond that percentage of impervious surface. So, you know, again, not, not to jump ahead to the, the substance of the dispute, but there, there is certainly the potential. There's been determinations that once you get beyond 20%, some bad things start to happen downstream. Okay. Anyone else want to just straw poll it? I mean, sure. well, and sorry, John. Uh, can we describe the Murphys as in a butter? <coughs> They're across the street. Does that count? And the only reason that they have standing to raise an issue is that they have a personal right in the form of an easement that's across the street. So are they a butter to challenge that point? Putting the easement aside, putting the paper street aside. Assuming that they own it, assuming that they have a right to the easement. Well, you're asking to, are you asking? Sorry. Let me restate the, the question. So I think the, the gateway question for me is, are they in a butter? I mean, do I have the right to object 
to the Goldman's home because I think that there was an error. They've raised two allegations for lack of butter. One is their kitty corner to the lot. I mean, that's pretty close. The second is the easement. So do either of them rise to the level of the butter? The difference being with the easement, if they have the easement right, they are then downhill of any potential runoff. The question is whether it's reasonable potential for runoff. But they don't own the easement. But they have a right to, to it. it. Right. So they would be able to sue the owner of the easement to have enforcement purposes. But the thing is, their right to the easement doesn't give them the right to not have a muddy easement. It could, if who, there's nothing that I see that says it can't just be a muddy pit that they have to. So they can enforce their right to the right, owner. I, mean, I, hear, I hear what you're saying. I'm, I'm not, yeah, I mean, but he, I mean, that's a nuisance claim. That's yeah. not what we're here for. Yep. I, I mean, I'm, I'm with. I'm, I, I, I know where you're going. I'm not. I'm, I'm going to agree with you. I mean, that's the part that I'm looking at as well. Is where are they in a butter under our code, right out of the gate? To and these are the only. The Murphys are the only family or people that have objected. So there, were, there was a. This is before uh, my time. Uh, yeah, a bunch of, there's, I don't remember which was the Goldman's versus the Livingston's, but then there's uh, some association in the area and there was uh, arguments of whether the association existed or whether it, they failed to like file their own corporation, nice. all this other stuff. So there were a bunch of other people in the neighborhood that had previously, but that was, it, I think we're, yeah, we're, that's, we're, that's, that's not, a totally different issue. We're closed, yeah. Correct. Right. This is correct. Just, correct. So when we talk about the abutter, that's the injury, right? Because you're actually touching another property. We're not because the home is across the street. They're not a touching the concept of abutting, right? So if there's a problem with the coverage, under the law, whether their rights run to the middle of the street or any of that stuff, but because then you have that corner touching. But I mean, you're pretty close if you're literally right across. The street. No, the direct abutter and then the little abutter. I think if you're right next to it, you're a direct abutter. Uh, yes. I think these are abutters. I mean, that's my opinion, not being an attorney. I don't know what the, uh, there's no definition in the ordinance. They, they do, however, receive notices that have abutters when you go across the street under the Cape ordinances. So, as a matter of discretion, shall we assume or not assume that, that these. Um, the Murphys are butters for the purposes of standing. By virtue of, By virtue fact, of where their lot sits or well, by virtue have, of where their easement is? The easement is not in play. I, re I asked that question. All right, and, the, and there was a hypothetical, a theoretical assertion of a claim for the easement. And that was not asserted. What we are asserting is the covering issue, which is? I think there's uh, from both. I, I did, they're asserting under both the easement and their actual lot. When he iterated the, the injuries that had occurred, but, he covered both. So. But I think Matthew is trying to actually narrow and say, so, I mean, I'm not going to put words in your mouth, but it's, let's, assume, let's assume there's no, there's no easement issue here. But they are a, a kitty corner to the, you know, to the Goldman's residence, and are they, would, are, do you view them as of butters, and if there are butters, mean, I, they touch on a concern. I, I mean, for the for the purposes of this limited argument right now, yes, I would say they're not butter. Set, setting aside the easement and the paper street, yes, which we'll come back to, I would say they are not a butters because of where their property sits across the street. We're not kitty corner. On the same side of the street, we're actually across, across the street. Right, diagonally across the street. So the argument is that they, there's a another property owner in between the two, so they are not abutters. Well, if I don't know the, the, the way the law works, but if the rights extend to the middle of the street, if you actually look where the lots lie, they would abut. The land does abut for a small portion based on at least the four acres map. Right. And I, and I don't know the legal. De I mean, I don't have the legal definition of an abutter in front yeah. of me. I, I don't. I don't know. I mean, there could be the issue of direct abutter. Yes. Yeah, I think we're mincing words at this point. Yeah. I mean, I would call, I would classify that as an abutter. It's so close. It's not like it's a street away. It's not like it's 10 houses down. We're basically saying it's someone across the street. But, but this is a gate, gateway question. It's like using the word shall. You you don't know, have there's to, no discretion on shall. You don't have to be a abutter in order to establish standing. It's just the test 
when you're a butter is slightly, the, the bar, the threshold is lower if you're deemed in a butter. At least that's my understanding, looking at the case that was cited by the, the Spirit Court. But again, I'm not offering any legal advice here. <coughs> so, uh, right. Is there a, where in the, uh, what, uh, go ahead, John. I want to do this. Let's just, um, we'll go, we'll, we'll circle back to what we have to circle back to, but I, Josh, you asked the threshold, but you know, I'm also saying, what's the straw poll? Is, without showing hands, where do you come down right now, standing or no standing? Yeah. Chris? I'm, I'm torn, but I lean towards standing, but depending on the minute you're asking me, I can put back and forth. I'll come back and ask for another minute, but that's, okay. Yeah. But again, I guess, there's no sense belaboring this if, yeah. if we're kind of all coming down on one side or the other. Jeff? No. Um, I'm no at this minute. No. No. Okay. Well, for the yeses, do you want to have a second go at this, or we're, we're having a motion? <laughs> well, I think that uh, what what are the reasons for no? We don't have a definition for a butter. We've had a general discussion as to what a butter is. We, we, could, just, we could also ask town council yeah. for uh, a definition. Of yes. For his guidance. Sitting right here. Right. Um, Let's ask the town council about it. You want to do that? Yeah. Stall for time. <laughs> Good evening. Um, the law court has held that in the context of these type of standing cases, a butter is usually given a fairly broad interpretation. Uh, there have been cases in which people who are not physically contiguous to a subject property are found to have been considered abutters, and persons across the street have been considered abutters. Um, so physical contact with a property that's the subject of a dispute is not required, although that's typically what's meant when you talk about an abutter, is somebody who's physically touching. In this context, the law court said, we're not going to have that such a rigid construction of the term, we're going to have a little broader concept. Do you know whether the case law that talks about someone across the street involves disputes where the residents across the street can actually see, I mean, it's something that's... But, that's, that's, but we're just talking about the definition of... Yeah, I'm talking about the definition, where they've actually so, said, and a butter is across the street, I'm talking about in those facts, in those cases where they've said that a butter constitutes someone across the street, where they're dealing with issues, since they're probably looking at the circumstances of the case, were they dealing, do you know, offhand, whether they're dealing with issues where the person across the street, they're seeing something. It's something right there in front of them. It's, or in those cases, just don't know one way or the other. My recollection from uh, making a generalization is that they're usually apparent issues, apparent for somebody who's in their situation. Um, there is one case that I can think of where there's a, uh, a lot that was not, it's the next lot over. Okay, if you understand what I mean by that concept, There's a, there was a, a lot in between. And I believe, I believe that case involved a front setback issue. So uh, uh, arguably you're talking about something that's evident. Is it evident from somebody's front door one lot over? I'm not sure that the court got into that level of detail. Yeah. Uh, are, are you aware of any precedents or decisions finding that like uh, an aesthetically unappealing structure or building in any way uh, caused an economic injury by diminishing a property value such that it created a basis for standing to challenge some aspect of the uh, yes. dislike of it? Yes. And in, in that was found to be? Yes. I have the case citation if you want it. I'd love to hear that. It, it's Forrester versus City of Westbrook. Got it. Six of. They, and that was from the SJC or the Superior Court? So it's a law court decision. What was the holding on that, Summer? Uh, that the proposed construction having an aesthetic impact on the neighborhood legitimately conferred standing upon persons who obviously were affected by that aesthetic criteria. And presumably, um, the the rationale was that that aesthetic, it, they considered it 
in their argument to be a negative and therefore negatively impact their, their that, that they would be considered a negative impact on, on the property values. Sorry, uh, what was the case name again? Uh, Forrester. Um, Forrester versus City of Westbrook. And, and that was, uh, presumably that was visible to? My recollection of the case uh, is that it dealt with an issue that was apparent to the neighbor that was challenging it. But not necessarily the neighborhood, but. Right. So the Goldmans would potentially differentiate by saying in this instance, unlike Forrester versus City of Westbrook, it, the change is not visible from the Murphy's lot that they own. The able counsel here to be able to handle that. <laughs> <laughs> but, got it. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks. So there are butters. Based on town council, I would agree that they would fall within the broad de definition of an abutter. So that means that the they need only show a relatively minor adverse consequence to have a stamp. It, it, they get that very low bar for abutters. That are reasonable, reasonable. Yes. Reasonable potential. And reasonable potential. And as an abutter, they have that because they're what's the injury? Can they well, and, and now this, this, and this comes back to, and again, if there's four, one, two, three, if, there's, if it's five to one, we don't even need to have this discussion. But um, the paper street and the easement, are you just writing that off? Are you just saying we're not even discussing that because? We didn't discuss. No, 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 but, but I'm, asking, I'm asking from, you know, from your perspective, are you saying that the paper street isn't part of your analysis because they I haven't shown a actual legal right to the distinct, distinction that I'm making is that the harm is the real property interest across the street. That that's the concept of what we're talking about when this the, for coverage purposes. And the Murphys have come here and have asserted the harm to their to a harm, but they don't assert the basis upon which that harm originates from the easement. Right? Because they, well, they do not, or they, they have not articulated. I don't believe they have, have stated that it, it, there's an impact to the easement, because it doesn't touch the easement. That's my understanding. I mean, it, does, it, doesn't, it doesn't impede on, physically impede on the That's easement. That's right. But so they are only aware of the stairs, or whatever the coverage issue is, when they're standing on the easement. The, their argument was the impact on the easement is, first off, A, the easement is immediately adjacent to the lot. B, it's downstream of the lot. C, the runoff because of the fact that the impervious surface exceeds what's permitted, um, has the reasonable potential of impacting their easement. But again, the easement is the right to travel. It's not quite clear it carries any right to like sit there and enjoy. But they then said there was an economic impact because of the fact that conveying their property, one part of the bundle of rights you obtain if you were to acquire their property from them is the right to travel on that easement. And that it's not as, um, as uh, desirable economically now because of the fact that um, Ms. Murphy said that there, um, that you have to look at the stairs. Yeah. <laughs> you have to look at the stairs. So that's, 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 that kicks into the, is it reasonable? But then yeah, I guess this. Not even, what, 10 yards of staring at stairs? That said, many people like the. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not trying to change your mind. I'm just, yeah, I'm, yeah, 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 but that's the argument. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And the question is whether this, it sounds like this forest, or at least for me, this forest or for city of Westbrook, does that give us a basis, that case to say that, if she's alleging that it's uh, an aesthetically unappealing set of stairs, and she's alleging that has an adverse impact on her property, is that sufficient to show a potential for a particularized injury in this instance, with from the easement perspective? The bare minimum, yes. I cannot rule it out. Is it reasonable? You asked me for the bare minimum. <laughs> uh, I think that. Well, we still have to get to the next stage here. Yeah. Um, or maybe not. We go the point stand. being is that um, I'm troubled with the easement, the paper street, and who owns it. I'm also troubled that it's across the street. But the town council has pointed to a case on point that it doesn't have to be touching. I'm, I'm, I'm fine with that. So the question is, where's the harm? The, har the harm is to the owner of the land of the paper street. I think that's there, all right. And then it's a nuisance issue for the purpose of using the paper street, assuming that the easement is perfected. 
So I think the Murphy's argument, though, was that their property comes with the right to travel on that paper street. The value of being able to travel on the paper street includes the aesthetic nature of what's going on around you, whether you're in the okay. natural environment versus developed stone stairs. I, I guess I object to the uh, dispute with the stairs. I think that's a discretionary point. The point being, bare minimum, fine. Uh, is it reasonable? Who to say? That's the standard. Guess what? That is the, that's we're the to say tonight. <laughs> I mean, the standard is, is you know, is, are they making a reasonable allegation for the potential of a particularized in, or in, uh, injury? I mean, that's, uh, I mean, the reasonableness is really, I mean, I'm going to go back to what I said a while ago. That really, to me, is when it comes down to the standing, is, is the threshold um, on, on much of this. There were stairs there before. So the utility, is that not the case? But not like these. Yeah. One set of stairs versus another. Well, well we, we previously touched in the last round that if they had been under, I think it was four feet or less in width, they could have put them in. But by exceeding that, it kicked off all of this. So one set of stairs is different from another. It, it actually does In the ordinance, if, if they're smaller stairs to access the waterfront, they're allowed. I'm saying that there was a thing there. They chose to put in something a little larger, and hence there's a procedure that actually here we are, or had further consideration. Okay. You know, I th this you know for me is 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 a is a it's a close call. I mean, I I think we're belaboring it because it's close. It's, it, it is close. Um, I I. I, you know, as, as someone who is across the street from the water, personally, I get the whole better concept. Um, I, but I, I guess I, I struggle with the fact that, that as a practical matter, um, the abutter can't see the steps. That they're not, they can't see the steps. They can't see what's going on there. And, and as a, um, from from an easement perspective, uh, you know, looking at the looking at the the photography, looking at the topography, um, it's it's hard for me to see where um, you know rainwater or whatever is is going to rush down Seaside Ave. Um, when you see you know they have grass landings at every five steps as it is, so it's not like it's a complete waterfall to begin with. But, but assuming that it's now increasing the impervious surface, assuming, which I'm obviously not making that determination or assertion right now, if it did push the overall impervious surface of the property to above 20%. We don't know that. No, we don't know that, but that's, that's the potential. I mean, it, it's the incremental. That's, yeah, I mean, you're, you can't look at the steps in, in a vacuum. You have to look at the steps. If, if the steps were the only thing there, if there was no actual house on the property, then the impervious surface issue wouldn't be before us. If but it's phrased not as the steps, but of the permitting more than 20% of the land to be uh, made impervious. It's phrased from that perspective. Is there a reasonable chance of injury by virtue of excessive road? And, and that I have a hard time seeing it, given the topography and the, and the uh, I mean, and my argument would just be that the, that twenty percent figure is in that—that's the shoreland zone. I mean, that's 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 the figure that is given to us. That is the—that's in the ordinance. So to kind of say, yeah, I don't see it. I think that's kind of overlooking what the ordinance says. There's a reason for it. There's a reason that the limit is twenty percent. Uh, Chair, one of the other things that was potentially discussed, well, I think it was discussed, but no evidence was submitted, was we've had several rainstorms in the past couple of months. So if there was proper torrential runoff, we wanted a great opportunity to go down there and take some photos and submit it that there was excessive runoff, and that we had a quag quagmire, and that it was not passable by, by, uh, by foot. Um, that evidence is not before us. What we do have is an assertion on, on the record, and, and no more. Um, so uh, the point being is that it's, well, it's still a hypothetical harm, 
as to whether there is uh, a problem with the access runoff. I think that's correct. And the question is whether we have to revisit that. So my last point. So I'm going to say yes on standing at this point by virtue of the fact that it's very, very close, but I would say there's a reasonable possibility of an adverse economic impact based on overdevelopment from a lot coverage standpoint over and beyond what's permitted in the shoreline zone. There's a reasonable possibility that would adversely impact the Murphy's uh, property value of their primary of their of their lot, and that would be the particularized injury. even though they can't see the stairs, they can see other aspects of the overall development of the lot. And so their injury is that because there's the potential of the impervious um, coverage being greater than 20 percent, their it's property the values may be adversely affected? Correct. Again, we don't have to make a finding that it has actually occurred. The question is that there's a reasonable, uh, reasonable potential for that to occur. But again, we might not be afford to, so it doesn't matter. And if we're 3-3 three, three in deadlock, I believe the appeal is denied as well, so it would have to be at least four finding standing, I think. But we might want to check with the town council on that. Mr. Wall, you want to hine on that? What's the query? How many of us have to find standing in order for us to move on to the other topics? Is it four or is it three? I think you'd have to find four voting that there is standing. Voting that there is not standing. At least. I don't know. Well, I'm just asking. I don't know. Why? No, I'm just asked again. Well, we're going to yeah, we're going to we're going to vote here shortly. I just Someone, yeah, maybe we should make a motion. Okay. Thanks, I, I I would move to find that there is standing for the. I would move that there is standing. I second for the challenge. Okay. Any further discussion? Do you want further discussion? No, I'm just asking if there's any further It's thinking time. It's thinking time. Fight. <laughs> okay. Um, ready to take a vote? No, you guys are ready to take a vote. It's already seconded, so. Okay. Um, so, all in favor that uh, the Murphys have standing to bring the appeal, raise your hand. Opposed? Three, three. So that is a uh, deadlock, uh, which means that the Murphys, uh, the board finds the Murphys do not have standing. Or, no, we don't. But, we but, don't find that. We don't find that the, they do not have standing. We, we did make a finding as to standing one way or the other. Maybe we should check with the town council on this. Well, if the, okay. It's a 3-3 three, three vote. It's, it's my belief that if um, a party has the burden on a particular issue and there is no majority on the vote, if it's a plural, if it's a tie vote, then they don't carry their burden in that regard. And therefore... So the chair was right. Okay, so with that said, <laughs> um, in light of the fact that it is a 3-3 uh, vote, um, the Murphy's administrative appeal um, is denied. And um, uh, 
I don't believe on that basis is no reason to proceed uh, with the other aspects of the appeal. Uh, I don't think we need, uh, Council, do we need to find a uh, finding of facts on it? Uh, that's an excellent question. Glad you're here. Um, <laughs> well, I don't know the answer to that question. You don't? For, for, a, tie, for a tie vote, I, I guess it's simply it's, it's that the, um, would, would the party with the burden doesn't, doesn't carry the burden. And is it worth that? It seems like just to be on the safe side, maybe we should vote on the non-controversial uh, things, or is that not even worth doing? I'm sorry. The, the uh, just just to kind of be on the safe side, should we vote on the non-controversial items regard, regarding um, the Murphy's on the property, all that other stuff? One through four. Um, yeah, that's probably safe. And the, and just thinking of this through, it it may be sufficient for the board to articulate that there there is no consensus that was reached by a majority of the board members with regard to either the, uh, the, the factual predicate for to establish standing. I think that's the best you can do under the circumstances. Can I propose a finding of fact? To, uh, to see if you can. Go ahead, yeah, please. Uh, just to the extent that the parties continue to um, hash this out, um, I propose a finding of fact that the Murphys are in a butter to the property issue. Yeah. I have to all these. I would only have one minor suggestion is that we considered the decision by the court um, and we actually looked at some of the points. I had four points, but you know, as long as we um, identify the points uh, that were raised in the court's opinion, um, we should be passed um, a objection. Wow. You're suggesting that we go through the court's remand order and might I suggest specifically the part on part on page four where they the court suggests that we look at the easement rights and nature of the injury? Thank you. And maybe a finding effect that we can have consensus on I guess we should, perhaps if we can articulate what we split on here. If it's three three that there's a, that there is a reasonable possibility of injury and that's where we split you know would help to the extent they continue to ash this out. I mean, it's, it says that the Goldman uh, might continue to contest standing easement rights and the nature of the Murphy's injury should be further developed. So I think that's what's going to go up on appeal now, uh, reasonably. So that's also part of the record that we're just going to have. Fine. Uh, Chair, if I, if I may. Um, the Murphy's attorney um, pulled me aside and suggested that whatever order is fashioned, it's clear that it pertains to both of the, the matters that are on appeal as part of this evening's proceedings, including the, both the uh, underlying um, uh, appeal from the permit as well as the appeal from the, the determination by the CEO as to the location of the, the district, uh, the property's location in which district. Um, Okay, then if that's the case, then, then you may have to take it in stages on that because um, it's my understanding at least that um, obviously this determination with regard to the permit appeal will probably be appealed back up to the Superior Court and they want to be able to consolidate the, the appeal of that matter with the appeal of the, the uh, uh, district determination issue. So, uh, okay, so, so well, this appeal, the, 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 the denial of this appeal is relative to the building permit. Okay, and we have an administrative appeal on the CEO's letter. So technically, we have to get to that. It sounds that's it. Perfect. <laughs> okay. Well, let's. I, I, I think we should probably then we get we need to do one then do the other. Yep. 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 
Um, uh, okay, so I guess going back to we're suggesting that, that we need to put in additional finding of facts around the relative. So if I might, I would suggest we vote. Um, I would propose a finding of fact that the, the Murphys have an easement right along Pilot, uh, not Pilot Point Road, uh, Surf Road. Surfside. Surfside Road. Uh, Surfside. Uh, I make that finding that that, uh, that easement right includes the ability to travel um, back and forth on that road. Um, I'd make the further proposed finding this one that we, we will not all agree on um, that the Murphys have a uh, reasonable um, potential for economic injury to their prop uh, reasonable probability of uh, economic harm to the value of their property by virtue of excessive lot coverage. Um, the not, we're that. not going to reach consensus on that. But it, to the extent we can vote on it, because then it provides a record for the court to the extent that they continue to hash it out. The court would then see that we voted 4-2 or 3-3 three, three or 6-0 oh on each of those issues. Okay, so, so I'm sorry, so the last finding you're suggesting is what? Uh, why, why, why do we need to come up with findings that we're not going to approve? Because if yeah. it turns out, because if we all agree 5-1 that there was the possibility of economic injury, but we nevertheless ended up with the results that we we ended up at, the court would say this is nonsensical and flipping this again. Or if we all said 5-1, there's no possibility of any economic injury, the court would say, how could anyone who said 3-3 three, three, that, there, that there was standing because everyone agrees there was no injury here? Does that make sense? It makes yeah, sense here for the review. Sure. Mr. Wall, you but if we three, three, yeah, I, I mean the the problem, of course, is that since since the 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 motion or, or the issue did not pass with regard to whether they have standing or in effect determining that they they can't proceed because they don't have the majority of the vote of the board to substantiate that they have standing. Um, it seems to me you can't parse too finally. Um, the kind of factual findings, you, you might be able to, I think, reach a factual finding that they are considered abutters for the purposes of this issue. But then uh, another fact that the board has not been able to reach agreement as to a potential for, a reasonable potential for particularized injury. Um, I think that's as far as you can go in terms of parsing the facts, because otherwise, if you get to, too far down factual findings that people aren't going to agree with, then. And I guess my issue, um, and obviously if everyone else disagrees with me on this, so be it, but if we're just making a conclusory statement that there's no standing, it doesn't give the court enough to work with one way or the other to make it easy for the parties to figure out what's going on here. And I, I just want to avoid the situation where it goes up to the court, the court kicks it back to us for, like, you got to give us more reasoning. Why was there no standing? So that's my concern. I'm looking to avoid. That. Well, um, perhaps um, uh, we have counsel here for the parties. They they may be able to assist you in terms of fashioning this. My recommendation would be that that you uh, limit yourself to um, a any type of factual determinations that you can make as a board, either that you agree with or that. Uh, that, that you agree with, like for example, if you all agree or majority agrees that they're butters, but they don't, we can't agree that they've shown this, then that's what you can state as a factual finding in support of the vote that was a tie. I, I just don't know how we can get into, I agree, I don't know how we can get into, uh, uh, I mean, you, our you, job is not to give, you know, the parties guidance. I agree. I mean, they, they, if, it's not guidance, it's justifying our conclusion. They have the transcripts. They'll have, they'll they'll have the transcripts. They can read them. They can listen to them. But the transcript them. doesn't reflect what each, what's inside of each of our heads when we came to that vote. It instead says, here's what, what, what was debated. We don't know what the rationale was supporting the conclusory statement that there's no standing. And without that, the record's just devoid of actual finding. Just very basic parliamentary procedure is that you have, you have voted that they do not have standing. So your findings support, should support a finding that they do not have standing. You don't get, you, you, 
you, your findings are if it was five to one, four to two, six zero. The board has voted that they don't have standing. But there are no actual findings as of yet that we voted on. Right, but those findings are, are going to the, you, you, you don't get a dissent. Yeah. Okay. Oh. <laughs> so the findings should support the board's vote that there was no standing. And my issue is previously we've been contradictory with our final conclusion and our fundamental findings where the findings did not support the conclusion and I'm hoping to avoid that if we can just articulate what our findings are. And if it's 3-3, three, three, that's perfect because that supports. I, I just, otherwise we're wasting, I mean, it is three, it's like three. we're wasting people's time right now, but we're wasting everyone's time if they're going to go up and down, back and forth between us and the courts if we're not articulating the rationale behind our decisions. So, if I'm the only one that feels this way. Does anyone else feel the way Chris does? Because, because I don't. I don't. All right. I don't either. Right. We, we can say that um, there was no finding of fact that there was standing or was not standing. What we have found is that there are three votes one way and three votes the other way. That is all. Because that has not been a determination because we don't have a majority. But there's no rule on that. It's not really true because they have to. There was a determination, three to three, because Robert's rules of order, I think, clarify something like that. That because, constitutes a negative. Well, the, the a moving party has not met the burden to actually find, get a finding that they do have standing. What did you say? <laughs> well, we've got the four finding of facts. In, uh, does, yeah, does any, uh, I, I don't, I mean, I, I you know, we, we've added, or, or it's, been, it's been suggested we had the Murphys are in a butter. Yes. It's been suggested that we add the Murphys have an easement right on Surfside Avenue Road, whatever it's called. Chair, that has been suggested. Um, that is a contentious issue between the parties and I suspect between the board members. Um, that is a property right. I'm not sure whether we have the actual jurisdiction to identify. We can actually and discuss in general terms as to what it is. But I'm not certain that we can make the determination that they do or do not have an easement. That's, that's yeah. a fair statement. Yeah. So let's strike it. Yeah. Uh, what if we phrase it where, you know. Let's strike it. <laughs> I'm not sure how much we have to phrase. Yeah. I think it, I, I, I think, just say that. I think one through four plus they're in about our. Okay. So let's go through the finding of facts then. Um, this is uh, to hear the uh, Supreme Court remand on the administrative appeal by Maynard and Deborah Murphy of the Code Enforcement Officers, August 17, 2012. And I just, the, the date on this is October 22nd, 2013. Um, Am I looking at? I'm looking at the, uh, it's the 20th, finding of fact. 24th, right? No. Wait, today's, today's 24th? Is that your point? It's September. Oh, in September, yeah. The date on the top as well. Yeah, I'm not citing that. Oh, okay. okay, that's a no, good, good sure pick up, but I'm not there. I want to make sure we have the correct date on this. That's all. Okay. Excellent. Okay. September 20, it's not even the 22nd. 24th. Thank you. Good. Okay. Uh, matter before the board to hear the Superior Court remand of an administrative appeal by Maynard and Deborah Murphy for the Code Enforcement Officers August 17, 2012 issuance of building permit 130036 to Pilot Point LLC for construction of a new accessory structure at 27 Pilot Point Road, tax map U12, lot 70. Finding of fact, Maynard and Deborah Murphy own the property at 24 Pilot Point Road and they reside there. Murphy's property is almost directly across the street from the subject property. On August 17, 2012, Pilot Point LLC filed an application for a building permit with the Code Enforcement Officer seeking a permit for construction of a new accessory structure at 27 Pilot Point Road. Three, on August 17, 2012, the CEO issued building permit 130036 for construction of a new accessory structure at 27 Pilot Point Road. On September 17th, 2012, the Murphys filed with the Code Enforcement Officer an appeal to the Zoning Board of Appeals challenging the issuance of the building permit 130036. 
uh, additional finding of facts, uh, the Murphys are an abutter to 27 Pilot Point Road. We probably should add that to 27 Pilot Point Road. Uh, the I guess we're actually taking a vote on the finding of facts, aren't we? Yeah. So, all in favor of those finding of facts? Put your hands. Any opposed to the finding of facts? Six zero. And the administrative. I'd, uh, Chair, I'd make a motion for an additional finding of fact that the Murphys have made a, a reasonable allegation of economic uh, injury due to uh, a aesthetically unappealing structure on 27 pilot. Uh, and, uh, and by virtue of the excessive lock coverage, the alleged excessive lock coverage. Let me rephrase that from the beginning. Uh, I'd make the additional, I move that we make an additional finding of fact that the Murphys have made a reasonable allegation of an economic injury by virtue of excessive lock coverage uh, at 27 pilot point. Uh, we can't, you can't say that because okay. yeah, it so was a 3-3 vote. I can make a motion. So here's my motion. Oh, that goes, that goes Fair enough. This is a finding of fact. The finding of fact that I'm proposing, and if you guys are going to vote me down, this is perfect because then we'll have it down on the paper. But that's what I want is to have a finding on this. What's the basis for finding no fanny? So the, no standing. The motion is that the Murphys have made a reasonable allegation of economic. Let's say allegation of reasonable. Fair enough. The Murphys have made an allegation of uh, a economic injury to their property value by virtue of purported excessive lot coverage on 27 Pilot Point Road. Period. Can I comment on that? We, we need a second for debate. Can I, can you, can you just say it one more time? Okay. I propose an additional finding of fact that the Murphys have made a reasonable allegation of adverse economic impact to their property value by virtue of purported excessive lot coverage at 27 Pilot Point Road. I'll second that. Now we can have a debate and then vote. I think we have to vote no on that because none of us are qualified to, to appraise um, any uh, value of that property, whether before or after. We're not qualified appraisers. You're attorneys. Totally agree with you, which is why the word allegation is in there. They've alleged it. Uh, we're not saying it's true. We're saying that they've made an allegation. And it's a, reason, it's a reasonable allegation. But I don't know if it's reasonable. That's the point. It's an allegation. Right. But that's why we're, we're, all we're putting on the record correct me if I'm wrong, Chris, is that the Murphys have made an allegation of, of essentially economic injury. Reasonable. Reasonable. So that's all we're doing. We're not saying we agree with it. No, I understand that. Do you, think it was re do you think it's a reasonable allegation? Do I think? If that's, in effect, no. what the vote's going to be. So no, I'm not qualified to say it. So I guess we can go forward with the vote then. We've got a second. Who so seconded it? I did. That's why we're debating this now. <laughs> okay. Um, are we debating or we're going to vote? We can, we're definitely voting. It's if you want to discuss the yeah, it's, it's, substance. We're discussing the motion. I think we've discussed it. We've already discussed it. My last two cents then. This is, I've been only on the board for since this year, and I've never had this experience that we're currently having. So I, I think this is um, perhaps for me unprecedented. I'll leave that as it is. I'm ready to vote. What I'm talking about is after we have all this findings of fact and we have the side motion, this is the unprecedented bit. Because we've never had this contested fact is my, my point. And I just want it because to the extent they're going to hash it out and it's going to go up. And that's I for somebody else. From my perspective, well, we kind of have an obligation and a duty to make findings that support our conclusions. And what I want to avoid is us just making conclusions with nothing. There are consequences of having three, three people on the board. It's just bad luck. It happens. You didn't have persuasive arguments and the, the evidence wasn't there or vice versa. I'm expecting this to be 3-3 and then everything's fine, but we put it on paper for the appeal to the extent there isn't. So, 
Well, you, this is a vote only to add the finding of fact. Correct. 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 It's, it's vote is, but the, I mean, the vote's already been taken on the yep. administrative appeal. Correct. Sure. I was just going to say that. <laughs> You got to so, write it down. I'm going to write it down. Uh, it's an it's an allegation the, of reasonable. The Murphys have made a reasonable. No. This is my phrasing in my motion. Okay, reasonable well, be an easy one. allegation okay. of adverse yeah, that's the, that's the economic. Yeah. I know what you're saying. Impact to their to the property to the value of their property um, at do we have the Murphy's address just to make this twenty-four. Twenty-four. Pilot Point Road. Pilot Point Road. By virtue of the purported uh, excessive lot coverage at 27 Pilot Point Road. I'm sorry. I, I just I just like to ask the town council if he thinks this is advisable to even vote on this because I, I hate to go back and withdraw my second, but I'm concerned about even voting on this, and I would just like to hear from town council what he feels. Uh, I I what I think Chris is trying to do is to coalesce where the where the board members differ. So he's made a motion, as I understand it, for the board to adopt a fact that apparently three board members agree with and three board members disagree with. And if that's the case, it, this is probably not a bad idea because it will indicate to the court the factual issue that divides the, the voting members. I could be wrong on this, but that's what it sounds like to me. That's my intent. Exactly my intent. Okay. Did, uh, no, isn't the hearing closed? Excuse me, Mr. Chairman. Isn't the hearing closed? He's a town council. It's okay. Oh, he's fine. But I mean, yeah. Well, technically, it's all closed. So the only thing we're hearing from the town council. So I am tech, I'm now making. I'm, I'm withdrawing my motion. And you said we withdraw your second, and then I'm going to rephrase it as written here. Yes. Okay. So, and what are you expecting is going to happen? I think it's going to help everyone to the extent. Do you that think that's going to be a three-three vote? Yes. I think it's going to be three-three, or maybe even a four-two okay. against it. But it's at least gives something on paper that's for an Okay. Because I I, 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 I don't view, I don't view that finding a fact and and the and the and the the uh, the the uh, what the hell am I trying to say the the, the motion that we um, the administrative appeal that we deadlocked on is, is the, the same thing. So what? I mean. I, I mean, all I'm saying is it's two separate. I mean, one's a finding of fact. Well, you know, we've already right, voted it, on. The, it would seem to me like if it's not going to be another three-three vote, then it's only going to further muddy things. Unless the chair votes against it, and then we there's at least something that can be looked at on appeal. But if the chair votes against it, where he voted yeah, in you're right, favor you're right, right, of standing true, four, so if the chair could articulate why he said that there was standing. I mean, he what was the injury? I mean, you don't have to, but that's why what I'm attempting to do is tease out why the, why we split. As the town council noted, I want to tease out for the court to the extent they continue to fight about this, what we split on as a factual matter, so that there's something that will ease any potential review, so that this doesn't go up, so it doesn't get kicked back down to us, where the court then says you didn't give us enough detail. Explain your reasoning again, because that's in effect what just happened here, and I want to avoid it happening again because it doesn't help anyone if we just. But, but of course, I mean, at the end of the day. They didn't carry their burden. The court's going to have all of the arguments, and they're going to see what the arguments that were made and the determination that, in the board's view, they did not carry their burden to prove standing. Okay. And then the court can make its own determination about whether or not the arguments 
carry the burden or not. And the court's going to see that there's an extensive debate where we attempted to nail down what the factual findings were supporting our decision. We couldn't reach any conclusion and couldn't reach a single finding of fact on the issue. The court's going to say, if, if, in this situation, can I say that, yeah, it's supported by the evidence of the record where they can't reach it, uh, they can't even come to a 3-3 vote on why they rejected standing or why they split on standing? We, we have done nothing to articulate why we reached the conclusion we reached, and it doesn't help anyone from my perspective. Maybe I'm wrong if we don't have, if no one wants to second the motion, so be it. But I would love well, I to heard. articulate why I, we reached the point we reached. I'll second the motion. So the, mo the motion as now phrased is, the Murphys have made a reasonable allegation of adverse economic impact to the, to the value of their property at 24 Pilot Point Road by virtue of the purported excessive lot coverage at 27 Pilot Point. I, yep, I get it. Oh, I'll second it. Okay. So, so does everybody wait, hear the motion? Wait. Let's. I <laughs> um, If you are attempting to parrot the law court's uh, verbiage on this, um, I believe if you check your motion, the one word you left out was the potential, reasonable potential for particularized injury. Thank you. Thank you. And I would withdraw my motion if you withdraw your second. Yes, we repropose the motion as the Murphys have made a reasonable allegation of potential adverse economic impact to the value of their property at 24 Pilot Point Road by virtue of the purported excessive lot coverage at 27 Pilot Point Road. Okay. Okay. All in favor of the additional finding of fact? Opposed? 3-3. Three, three. Give me that piece of paper. <laughs> okay, so just to be clear though on the additional finding of facts, finding of facts one through five was voted 6-0. The additional finding of fact, which would be number six, I guess, was 3-3. Um, three, three. So now we are turning our attention to the um, administrative appeal dated June 3rd uh, from Maynard and Deborah Murphy uh, concerning the CEO's determination of the Shoreland Performance Overlay District Boundary as being inconsistent with the zoning ordinance and zoning map and past practice of the town. Okay, so on this one, I believe the question really here, going back to standing, is Well, it's the basis under which the Murphys are, are appealing the CEO's determination. Of the high law. Of, well, uh, of, the, of the high water mark, right. Or the mean, I, I'm sorry, I'm being imprecise with. So the normal high water line? The, the um, I was reading, uh, where's the determination letter? Actually, <coughs> why can't I find your letter? That's the attorney's letter. Fans <laughs> letter. Oh, that is.
Yep, so his determination that um, the shoreland performance overlay district is all land within 250 feet of the normal high water line of coastal waters. That's, that I believe is what's being appealed. Mr. Bryant, hi. Yes, Chairman. Welcome back. <clears throat> this is an appeal, <clears throat> excuse me, of a determination of the, of the starting point for the shoreland performance overlay district, the shoreland zoning district and the normal high water line for coastal waters, <clears throat> excuse me, um, that was granted by the current code enforcement officer uh, upon the request of the Goldman's Council. And our appeal of that is that the CEO's determination of the shoreland performance overlay district boundary is inconsistent with the zoning ordinance uh, and the zoning map and the past practice of this town. In addition, I articulated some other reasons in the appeal which caused concern for us. And one of them is that this case is inextricably linked with the case that you just decided we did not have standing upon. And that is, from our perspective, we saw this CEO's determination of shifting the shoreland zoning boundary by some 67 feet towards the ocean um, was effectively a backdoor way of the Goldman's achieving um, the purpose, or excuse, achieving something that they were attempting to defend on the appeal of the previous permit, which uh, alleged that the shoreland zone 20% impervious surface issue had been violated. So in my view, it's not simply a matter that I think Mr. McDougall was wrong in his determination here, uh, in inconsistent with the zoning map and the zoning the language of the zoning ordinance and what has the past practice of town has been, but also that I question his ability to make that determination at this point while the uh, case uh, is under appeal on the previous code enforcement officer's issuance of a permit, which again turned on the issue of um, of compliance with the shoreland zone and its limitation on impervious service, among other issues. So there are some distinct issues associated with this, but many of the factual issues are similar to those that are at issue in the merits of the other appeal, which you just denied on the basis of standing. I'm not quite sure how you want to proceed. I submitted with, the, with this appeal, um, at the time of the appeal, copies of the Murphy's deeds, which include the deed to their lot on 24 Pilot Point Road, as well as a copy of the deed which includes their easement rights in Surfside Avenue. And I know it sounds like we've been down this road before, but that's because we have. Um, the specific language under which the appeal is made um, I think if you look at section 1952, powers and duties of the Zoning Board of Appeals, <clears throat> you have authority to determine whether the decision of the code enforcement office, officer is in conformity with the provisions of the ordinance and to modify such a decision to conform with such provisions and interpret the meaning of the ordinance in all cases of uncertainty. Specifically, there's a provision under section 1953 that says any, agree, any person aggrieved by a decision of the code enforcement officer or other municipal official were applicable, may appeal such a decision to the board within 30 days following the uh, date of such decision by filing a notice of appeal with the code enforcement officer, et cetera, et cetera. So we were timely in filing our appeal. We uh, provided our appeal in writing. We believe that we've established that we have standing because we are an abutting property owner in the broadest sense of the word, as was discussed by a corporation counsel in the immediately preceding hearing. And as, <coughs> as we look at it, um, this decision by this code enforcement officer uh, cannot be um, taken without looking at the context of the merits of the other case. So we're perfectly prepared to argue those merits. We came here prepared to, prepared to argue them on the last case. We think that in terms of standing, we 
I've shown through the testimony in the previous hearing, and I'm happy to reiterate that testimony, if you like, of Ms. Murphy, that she believes her property value has been diminished by the increase in uh, uh, impervious surface on the Goldman's property. That is even more likely the, to be the case if the, this current code enforcement officer's decision to shift the shoreland zone effectively uh, 67 feet towards the water is upheld by this board uh, and it certainly affects her property value because then arguably, although we think we'd win on the merits, arguably the Goldmans can say that whatever happened in the previous appeal, we have a different shoreland zone now and different restrictions on our property. So never mind about what happened before, what we did is fine, regardless of how improper it was at the time. So I, I'm really at the board's pleasure. If you'd like me to present the same arguments I presented earlier about the, um, uh, about the harm to the Murphys and their ownership interests in 24 Pilot Point and their ownership interests as easement holders in Surfside Road, I'm happy to do so. Uh, I'm just as happy to also say that, uh, that if you will accept the testimony that we just gave in the previous hearing, which I think is an appeal inextricably linked with this one, um, then I'm happy to submit that as part of the record for this appeal as well. And perhaps Corporation Council might have a view on whether that's prudent or not. Well, do you have any... Uh I think based upon the, the nature of these two uh, appeals being linked to a certain extent, I don't really see any problem utilizing the record from the immediate proceeding. It's the same parties. It's the same evidence. He's indicating it's, it's already been heard by the board. I, I really don't see any benefit necessarily in re repeating that. Okay. Yeah, no, I, I, I would agree with that. Um, I, I guess... A, a question I have, Mr. Bryant, is if, if you look at this appeal, I'll use the word isolation, I'm not sure I quite mean it like that, but um, can, why can't the Goldman just get a determination from, from the CEO as to, as to where the high water mark is for their own, for their own use? I mean, well, they can, yeah. but if we did not, if we had failed to appeal this determination um, and presented it, presented our case on the merits before you, then I think we would have effectively lost our appeal of the other case because we would be told that we were stopped from raising any of the merit, uh, arguments on the merit because we had an opportunity to do so here when we were aware of this appeal, and I don't want that to happen. I, my whole goal here is to try to get this board to listen to the merits of the case against the issuance of the permits to the Goldmans that increased the impervious surface on their lot and allowed uh, construction of a structure that is in violation of the ordinance. That's what this board is here for. That's what I'm trying to get you to do. So again, I'm happy to present arguments. I'm happy to go under the merits. I don't think Ms. Costigan would appreciate that, but it's really the board's pleasure as to how you want to deal with it. I'm also happy to stipulate, if Ms. Costigan will, that the transcript and the evidence produced in the earlier hearing can be considered as having been given in this hearing uh, for purposes of appeal up to the Superior Court. Oh, no, I, I'm happy to, 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 to rely upon the existing record. I, I, no, that's, that's fine. I, I, um, so I found the citation from the town's council of Forrester versus city of Westbrook very uh, useful in the last matter. Can you point to any case where a, a butter was, or anyone was able to challenge or standing existed for a determination as to a, um, a, z a zoning uh, district boundary. 
where the standing was found for someone to challenge a determination for someone else's property as to what district it lied in? Um, I can't right off the top of my head point that out to you, but I will point out to you that a decision by the code enforcement officer is a decision by the code enforcement officer. Your duties under the ordinance say that you have the jurisdiction to hear those appeals by anyone aggrieved by that by determination. But this goes to the aggrieved uh, injury aspect again. Right. Well, what's happened is, again, I don't want to get into the merits because I know you don't want me to go there, but <clears throat> everyone, the, when the Murphys bought their property and when the Goldmans bought their property, their property was shown on the Cape Elizabeth zoning map as being entirely within the shoreland zone. They're purchased, each party purchased with knowledge of that. The Murphys <coughs> knew that the land across the street could not be developed beyond 20 percent without violating the shoreland zoning and that their, the value of their investment in their property would be diminished if somebody were allowed to violate that ordinance. And that's what's happened here. No, I, Chris, this is a democracy, <laughs> relatively speaking. So it, it makes them aggrieved because their interest in having the, their, the house directly across the street from them, which I understand the property lines actually do overlap a bit uh, because the property lines have changed from the original uh, uh, Shoreland Acres map. But their property that across the street overlaps their pro uh, the Goldman's property across the street, which overlaps their property, um, if that is allowed to be in violation of the Shoreland Zoning Ordinance, and the Murphys, who not only have a property directly across the street, a portion which is directly across the street, but whose residence overlooks the uh, Goldman's property, and who have as an important aspect of the value of their property an easement right to go on the opposite side of the Goldman property, if they don't have, a, if they aren't a, an aggrieved person with a right to appeal, I don't know who anybody is. That's the problem. And if that's the case, then you only hear uh, appeals from people who are directly abutting and can look out their window and see the particular violation. And that's not what the, the zoning ordinance says. It talks about your job is to properly interpret the zoning ordinance and your job is to make sure that the determinations made by the code enforcement officer are correct and conform to the code. That's what we're trying to get you to do. Um, okay, thank you, Mr. Bryant. Um, do we have questions? I mean, I mean, as a practical matter, um, I'll be honest with you, I'm just struggling with this a little bit in, in that we can't get beyond the standing issue, apparently. You're not the only one struggling, I might point out. If I may. Yeah. So obviously we, we know we need to hear from the, the Goldman's attorney here. But I think it all plays out exactly as with the last one. And I would again propose that we go with that finding effect that I propose that we split on. And, for, and just to further articulate why I think that's valuable to do, it's because for me, what pushed me across the line to find standing was that finding that I reached that view on. And if that finding is not upheld by the board, then I would not have found standing. So by splitting that on a 3-3 on that, both in the prior issue and on this issue, it then gives that uh, the support for the conclusion that the board. Can I just suggest we hear from the board? Which I'd like to see yeah. here again. Hello, Mary Costigan for the Goldmans. So there is a, um, a provision in your ordinance where if there is an uncertainty, and, and this is section 19-2-4 of the Cape Elizabeth Zoning Ordinance, and I'll just, I'll read it in its entirety. Where uncertainty exists at, as to the location of any zoning district boundary, the property owner so affected may request in writing that the code enforcement officer make a formal written determination. The code enforcement officer shall make a written determination within five working days of receiving a request if the property owner does not agree with the code enforcement officer's determination, the property owner 
may appeal this decision to the Zoning Board of Appeals as an administrative appeal in accordance with Section 19-5-2, Powers and Duties. To me, that your ordinance is saying only a property owner can appeal that decision. Does it and say I, only, though? Let me finish. <laughs> and that it makes practical sense. And I agree with the chair that we should. This is a separate appeal. Looking at this in isolation, they have not demonstrated any harm that would result from a determination of a zoning district boundary. And that's all this letter does. It determines the zoning district boundary. It is not until the property owner does something in reliance on that determination that could potentially harm somebody else. We, we disagree that there's even harm resulting from that. But the, the, the determination of a zoning district boundary alone does not cause harm. And if they want to challenge the merits of that letter and the, high uh, the, the normal high water line or the location or the measurement of 250 feet, the substance of that, if, well, they haven't gotten past standing, but if they had gotten past standing in that appeal, they addressed the substance of that within that appeal. But this is not a separate appeal for them. They don't have a separate avenue here. They have not been harmed. In any way by the establishment of this line. The argument that because the map showed the picture and when they bought their property, they should have thought that everything was in there, that's not a good argument because if they went and looked at the ordinance, they would see that the shoreland zone is actually within 250 feet of the shoreland. So, and most property owners don't, you don't rely on the zoning map you have if you're, if you're um, if you have a zone that's measured in meets and bounds, you go by the meets and bounds. And so that determination of where 250 feet is on their property alone does not harm the Murphys in any way. They have not established any harm. All the harm that they've talked about is harm resulting from the building permit application. And that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about a determination of a line, a letter, um, that your ordinance only allows the property owner to appeal and nobody else. Uh, thank you. I uh, apologize for interrupting. Uh, <coughs> I don't see only in 19.2.4. It says the property owner can appeal. But if we switch to section 19.5.2, uh, which discusses um, administrative appeals, basically, we can hear an appeal for, by any party that's aggrieved by a decision of the CEO. Uh, again, that turns, there's the aggrieved. aggrieved yes. yes. Which you, you raise an interesting argument as to whether there's any injury just by a by a statement or a decision by the CEO. Termination. Right. Just that, or, or, but would you agree then that to the extent that the, in this issue, it, it's odd in this circumstance, but to the extent that a party then acted on that determination by the CEO at that point in time, the issue would become ripe for the other, for the abutter to challenge? It's a different, they, it, it's a different argument. Their harm is not from the line, but their harm is from an action that was taken in reliance on that line. So they could act at that point to challenge where the line is? Sure, yeah, which is, well, if they get past standing, which they haven't, but if they did, if they that's standing. where we talk about the merits. So they, would, they can talk about the 75, they can talk about the normal high water line, they can talk about where 250 feet is. So you would agree that the CEO issued a letter saying here's where the line is. At, if the party that received the letter six months down the road acts on it to receive a, uh, to, and they obtain a permit for some construction at that point, and a butter could challenge that determination as to what is and what is not in the shoreland. If they demonstrate that they're aggrieved they and they get past standing, they can argue that. I, I want to. I don't want argue. I want right. Would, but would they, if they had standing, could they challenge? Would they? Would they be able to challenge it, or would they have waived the right to challenge it? Because I don't want to create the situation where if I say, yeah, you're right, this isn't something that can be challenged now, we basically have slammed the door on them and said, oh, you can never challenge it now. Right. The, the merits of the decision in terms of the location of, see, this case is, and I still, I kind of have to talk about the merits to answer your question, which is, what happened the last time is that everybody agreed where the 75 feet 
the, excuse me, the normal high water line was. But you didn't measure 250 feet from there to get the shoreland district. Because we said the zoning map you looked at the map. as opposed to the 250 feet measurement because the zoning map was inclusive as to what it is. It doesn't actually lay out meets and bounds. Instead, it gives some examples. And if you look at what the examples are, they actually don't include being next to the coast. So therefore, it must be uh, a list of examples in the map does control, not what you've identified as meets and bounds, if you want to go to the merits, from my view. Well, that's your perspective. I have a different perspective, which means yep. meets, meets and bounds is 250 feet. And, and that, yeah, but. Yep. <laughs> that's, that's in re relation to coastal wetlands, and we're not talking about coastal wetlands. Yes, we are. We're talking about coastal wetlands. We're talking about a cliff. It's, it's not coastal wetlands. We're, we are actually but talking about coastal wetlands. Now we're just disagreeing. <laughs> <laughs> so we're clearly under merits. So. That's, how, that's how you measured the shoreland zone from coastal wetlands. So you have that, yeah. So it, it's the same, it's one and the same. The edge of the coastal wetland is the same as the normal high water line and you measure from that depending on whether you're talking about the 75 set book or the, or the 250 foot zone, but. So. <laughs> anyway. It's anyway, I, I believe that they can, if somebody has standing to, uh, to attack, the, to get to the merits of a building permit that's issued, they can argue that the normal high water line was incorrect and the, the, the shoreland zone line is incorrect within the confines of that appeal, but they do not have separate appeal rights, but just by virtue of the line, because they have no harm. And I'll just reiterate what Mr. Bryant said, which is if this board disagrees with me and you think that they can go beyond that and they're allowed to appeal that when it, in terms of being aggrieved, we reiterate what we said before, um, the same arguments that they have not, they have, have even less of a showing of harm in this instance because it's just a line. that it, They can't be arguing the impact of stairs because that hasn't happened in this world. This is just a line. Thank you. Um, oh, Mr. Bryant, you're gonna talk again? Yes, I would. Right. Can you limit it to like three minutes? I will be brief. On the issue of standing. On the issue of standing, on the issues that were discussed by Ms. Costick when she spoke to you. I think I have a right to respond to those. She talks about it. And I did not mean to open that door. And now, from my perspective, you're not in any way waiving quiet. rights if you don't touch on it. <laughs> she attempted to argue that, um, that the determination by the code enforcement officer as to where the line is and where the, zone, where the shoreland zone starts is, is a decision <clears throat> that would not be binding upon us were we to challenge a subsequent building permit. I am confident down to the soles of my shoes that if that situation occurred, Ms. Costigan or some other counsel for that property owner who got that building permit would be up arguing that very point. And I don't want to waive that. That's why I appealed this decision. The argument that is just a line, I think that's facetious. It ignores reality. Um, there's a context to this, and that context is that the planning board, following up on the decisions, uh, the hearings that this zoning board of appeals had <clears throat> with respect to shoreland zone issues, has actually been considering a, an amendment to the shoreland zone and the definition of normal high water mark proposed by our current code enforcement officer. And that uh, process has gone absolutely nowhere because the zoning, the, the planning board in reviewing that uh, proposed amendment realized that shifting the, the definition of the normal high water mark to um, a, what I call a still water bath line is going to shift the shoreland zone 60 to 70, in some cases more feet towards the ocean. So there will be a significant portion of Cape Elizabeth's coastline that is now subject to regulation under the shoreland zone that would not be if that occurred. So it is a substantive issue. And part of the argument, again, perhaps it goes to the merits, is that the code enforcement officer here, decision here was not just simply an administrative decision, that it was effectively a legislative decision that has to be taken by the town council in deciding to shift the zone, and that has to go through the process of being reviewed by the planning board and then going back to the town council before that can occur. So I, that's a huge jurisdictional and perhaps constitutional issue about the authority of the code enforcement officer to make this decision. Um, and I think you have to be aware of that context. That's 
why the planning board has that process of considering zoning amendments and going to the town council is so they get they get they consider more than just the viewpoint of a single property owner. Second thing I would point out is that along the same line is that I actually believe that the appeal <coughs> that the determination that the Goldman's uh, the section of the ordinance the Goldman used to obtain a determination of where the district boundary was should not really have been section 924 but should have been section 925 which on its face deals with resource protection district boundaries but in the language of the ordinance itself talks about location of resource protection and buffer district boundaries and what it does substantively is provide that those kind of decisions are not made in isolation they have to go to for the planning board the planning board can involve the conservation commission so there's a much more involved and much more public process that assures that decisions made in that context which could have significant effects across the entire zoning map and shoreland zone and the entire zoning ordinance are not uh, considered by this board or the code enforcement officer in the context of a single piece of property because the determination made on this property is going to be used with respect to the properties next door and soon you're going to find that every piece of Cape Elizabeth coastline with a with a rocky cliff is suddenly going to have the shoreland zone boundary 60 feet out from the top of the bank or the top of the cliff which is the language that the ordinance use so again I know I'm edging into the merits on things but that's why uh, this is not simply just a line and that's why there's a particularized that there's a significant injury and that's why there are issues that need to be addressed on the merits before someone and I don't believe it's appropriate for this board to simply stop your ears to what's really going on out here and decide we just don't want to hear anything and that's the last thing I think I say Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Bryant. Ms. Koskin, do you have any? All right, but you only got a minute and a half. Number one, this is not a resource protection zone. It's the Shoreland District, so that section does not apply. Number two, what's happening at the planning board and what has or not happened is irrelevant. That is outside the purview of this board. We don't know what's going to happen. What we do know is that this board has determined that the mean low water mark is, is, is very close to the determination that's been made in, in Mr. McDougall's le in Ben's letter. Um, and so, and that same determination has been made next door. So to, I know, to imply that this is revolutionary somehow um, is, is quite an overstatement. And again, they, he just spoke for five minutes and I didn't hear anything about harm to the Murphys by this determination of where the shoreline zoning district boundary is on 27 Pilot Point Road. Thank you. Um, any? Could I just cite something in the ordinance for you that relates to what I said? It was section 10, I'm oh, sorry, 1910.3. Concerning amendment to the zoning ordinance. What, can you repeat and I, that? 1910.3. 1910.3. .3. About what it takes to amend the zoning ordinance. And I, I just wanted to make sure that site was on the record because, like I say, part of my argument is that determination made here effectively uh, is an amendment of the zoning ordinance and the zoning map without going through the appropriate process of amendment of the ordinance. We know the zoning map, I think, I can cite the section if you want. The zoning map is part of the zoning ordinance. Uh, pursuant to section okay, let me find it. Too many stickies. Our zoning map is in section nineteen two two. And it's made part of the ordinance therein. I just want to make sure the record showed those sites for those sections of the. 1922. 1922 talks about the zoning map and makes it a part of the ordinance and talks about zoning districts as being defined as shown on the official copy of the zoning map. Mm -hmm. And my contention is that the determination by the code enforcement officer in this particular instance 
because it had such a drastic effect on the zoning map, shifting the, sh the, the shoreland zone so significantly. It was effectively a legislative act that could not be carried out by uh, an administrative officer. It has to go through the town council. Thank you. Uh, any public comment? Okay. Um, close the public comments portion of the program, and I guess Tears from the town. Oh, the town. Oh, the town. Want, Mr. Wall, you'd like to speak? I'd like to ask him some questions. Oh, Mr. Wall, you're going to be get peppered. Uh, um, I'm concerned the point that was raised by the Goldman's attorney that basically we're being asked to give an advisory opinion here until someone acts on this statement. Uh, can you comment on that? And can you? Are you aware of any case law saying that basically an abutter has the right to challenge a uh, zoning boundary determination and, and with it, someone else's law? And just to follow on that, I mean, the, we have this language in 1924 which talks about the property owner who has requested the line termination. It's the property owner, not only, it doesn't say only, but it says the property owner. And I understand that later in the ordinance it talks more broadly, but this seems to specifically apply to at least the determination that was made here. Are you asking what my opinion would be with respect to Does those two provisions you? that have been identified? Yes. It would be my opinion that to the extent they could demonstrate that they are aggrieved by a determination by the code enforcement officer, they would have the right to be able to, they would have the right to appeal. They would of course have to demonstrate standing and that would be part of the aggrieved uh, uh, I'm criterion. So, well, I'm sorry, one more time. <laughs> Um, I, I think that the language of those two provisions suggests that 19.24 right, does not say does not say only. And in my reading of these two to harmonize them, which is what you're supposed to do when you have two provisions and they can be harmonized. It's my opinion that if somebody can demonstrate that they're aggrieved by a decision by the code enforcement officer, whether it's this decision or some other decision, and they can demonstrate standing based upon that being aggrieved by the decision, then they should be allowed to for go forward with the appeal. But it does, it is predicated on standing. And so to that point, are you aware of any decisions where simply a determination by a CEO as to the boundaries of a zone was? I have searched, I have not found any. That doesn't mean they're not out there. I just, I have, I've done the Lexus search on this and I haven't been able to locate anything in Maine. So is this akin to us offering an advisory opinion on the topic or, or is it basically something where we should be waiting until someone actually acts on this determination and I, then we step in? I think as soon as somebody can demonstrate to you that they are, they have a potential particularized <laughs> injury, then you, then you can act on it. All right, fair enough. I don't mean to be coy, it's, but that's the answer. The answer is I can't, I can't tell you because, because somebody may have an argument that, that convinces the board that in fact they demonstrate a particularized injury, whether it's this case or some other case. And you've never found that? I have not found a case in which a determination of a boundary location by a code enforcement officer was appealed by an abutter and the court acknowledged that for a variety of reasons they've been able to demonstrate standing. I've also not found any cases which said that they, that they haven't. So have you found any cases where somebody has appealed the determination of a boundary? I have not. No, boundary, lo, boundary location, no. Okay. I have not. So it's never really been... Taken. Not that I've been able to, to find. Okay. Thank you. Well, putting aside our, our finding of standing on the prior appeal for a moment, I, I guess from my perspective, the other, the other question that, that um, I guess that I have or observation is that the, um, the determination by the CEO um, relative to boundaries on the high water mark um, doesn't you know? Doesn't necessarily. We, we haven't heard how the Murphys are, are harmed by that particular determination. In the grand scheme of things, 
you, you put them both together, you know, you can get them. But this is where, you know, we, we have two separate appeals. You know, we've already determined that, that you know, st they don't have standing in appeal one. In appeal two, it's, you know, given what, what council has said, you know, maybe you could get there where it's not just the property owner, but we're still back to, yeah, but how are they harmed by the CEO's determination? If I may. It's, it's a discussion. Uh, um, I think what the Murphy's articulated in the way that these are slightly different, and I don't know which way I go on this, I really have to mull it over, is um, in this instance, people acquired their lots with the expectation that the abutting properties were completely in the shoreland zone and they were therefore restricted on what they were allowed to do. And to now change uh, everything at this point, they actually know they're allowed to do more than you thought, but on that lot, that adversely impacts But, but the sh I mean, I don't know. The, the shoreland changes over time. So, and, and the map should presumably also change with the shoreline. So it's not, it's not a static thing. I mean, there's erosion. So to say that a property owner bought property and looked at the map and saw that, you know, this was within the shoreline zone and this wasn't, and then, you know, made decisions based on that, people understand that shorelands change. And so the shoreline zone is going to change over time. So I, I don't think just saying that decisions were made because this was in a shoreland zone or not, or abutting a shoreland zone. I don't, that argument doesn't hold a lot of water for me. Does the CEO's decision, the, the concept of this decision he's made being binding on everyone going forward, does, do, you, do you buy that? Or do you think that this is not binding in any way until someone acts on that? I mean, I, my inclination is to say there is, there is no injury right now. Or the, 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 the determination of a line in and of itself in a vacuum, and it's, it's, I'm having trouble reconciling this because it doesn't feel like we're in a vacuum. Mm -hmm. But the, the determination of, of, of a line, mm -hmm. and that's what's being appealed here, is yep. the it's, determination it's, of a line. That's all we're being asked right now, mm -hmm. looking at this. One, until you act on that determination. But haven't we been pretty cons I mean, I think this board generally has viewed, well, I'll speak for myself. I mean, I've generally viewed the, the high water mark as being where they're, you know, where you see this, the staining on the rocks. I don't get too caught up in the bank and the cliff and the, I mean, I, uh, so I, I'm not as troubled by, I don't think it's a, I don't think it's a precedent, but I'm not troubled by it one way or the other. Totally agree with you, but we made the finding last time, 7-0, that the entirety of the Goldman's lot is in the shoreland zone. And the C what's being argued is that the CEO has now issued a finding contrary to our prior 7-0 finding that the entirety of the lot is in the shoreland zone, and that the shoreland zone is actually beyond what's that in that 250 feet. We may add a 7-0 finding that the entirety of the lot was in the shoreland zone. And but as I recall... He's, he's now undermining that. I shouldn't use the word undermine. He's contradicted that with this letter. Sorry, Mr. Shaw, when you say 7-0, what meaning was It was that? before your time on the board. Thank yeah. you. So uh, with <laughs> the last time we went through all of this, we had lots of discussion on different issues. We split 4-3 on some issues, but there were certain findings that we were unanimous on, one of which was we said, under the map, the entirety of the Goldman's lot is in the shoreline. But as I recall, um, that determination was made in part, well, because the question, I think an open question was um, whether because a portion of the lot is in the Shoreland District, the whole lot is in the Shoreland District. In, in, I don't want to go too much. But how, how is this relevant to the standing? It, exactly. Help me understand it, guys, because I look at this as a very straightforward issue again which is standing. Yep. We hear about standing. Are they agreed? We have a, a code enforcement officer has issued an opinion, and does someone have standing yep. to address it other than the person who wanted the opinion? That's the Murphys. Are they aggrieved? Well, 
in the way that I look at it is if they're not aggrieved, I don't see how that it applies to everyone in town that in any way is affected by this. No one, from my perspective, is foreclosed from later on when someone acts on that opinion from the side. Well, I agree with that. I don't, I don't, I don't think that, that, that prevents that, someone, if they want to, if they then want to turn around and, and get a permit to build in accordance with that, someone can, uh, I think they can challenge object. The I can challenge the permit. I don't, I'm not going to yeah. suggest that they're barred from that in any way, shape, yeah. or form, because I don't, I don't believe that at all. But, you know, they issued an opinion, and yep. how they, so it's an opinion. How do they agree? Yeah. I mean, I look at the two provisions. What's the aggrieved? I mean, there's two different ones, and I read them well, either way. I mean, it, I, I t in total agreement yeah. with you, I would just like uh, any votes to reflect that fact that it, we're in no way saying that people are barred or that this people are foreclosed from challenging this thing in the future. Well, when it's acted on for an actual permit. Well, yeah, I mean, the decision to issue the permit is a, is a decision yeah. that 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 I think can, someone can can argue against. Totally agree. I mean, yeah, that that I'm not a problem. Okay. okay. The the uh, uh, I'll have two responses. The the question is whether the Murphys have, to your point, have standing right. to 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 bring that particular issue before the ZBA. That, that's your central, that's your central, I mean, that's what we're focused on. The issue of where but, the line is. Right. But, but the flip side is that, that I, I think we're talking about where they, are they being harmed by the termination of the letter? And it, doesn't that to some degree go to standing? Correct. Well, that, that's exactly what okay. I think. So, so, I'm, so yeah. all right. So, so all I'm, right, so, because of how this spiraled back to the, to the lot coverage, the, the, the question was, you know, if if the entire lot is 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 in a shoreland district, um, as opposed to a portion of it, then does that that does that change whether they they're they're damaged or not? And, and you know, Chris was just circling back to kind of what we voted on a, a year or so ago. Is that what it was a year ago? Something like that. would just note that I think the CEO's letter can be construed. It's, he states the shoreland performance, of, and again, I'm just talking about standing and how this, this is, I'm gonna tie this into standing. The shoreland performance overlay district is all land within 250 feet of the normal high water lines of coastal waters. He doesn't say that it, it is only that. So if that's viewed as a statement that it includes that, then I don't even see, I, I don't see how there's any injury, so there's no standing because that doesn't say it is only that land. He simply says it. I don't view that as a conclusive statement that it is only land within 250 feet of the normal high water line of coastal waters, because I don't think that in any way equates back to what the, the, the scope of the district is. So I would interpret it that way, and I'd say that there's no injury. Okay. So no standing. OK, so any, anyone else have anything to add before we Try and take a vote. You're out, Kathy. I have plenty to say, but you know, canvas the okay. particular point. Um, so can uh, I have a motion for um, this particular administrative appeal? I guess the motion would be that the um, I'll, I'll make a motion that 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 the that the uh, Murphys do not have standing to deny the appeal. Sorry. To deny the appeal uh, because they don't have standing. I'll make a motion to to the, deny the appeal because the Murphys do not have standing. Second by, yeah, why not? Um, all in favor? Opposed? That, was that 6 0? 6 0. 
Josh, you second that? Yes, I was it the year. Yeah, I was. Yeah. A, I presented. Josh seconded. Six zero. Yeah, you got that. So the administrative appeal is denied. Um, do we really have any additional finding of facts that we need to work through on this? So I think that uh, concludes the uh, where is the agenda? Concludes our agenda for this evening. Thank you very much for attending.